Kita mungkin sering melihat uh, dalam movies di mana seseorang uh, pemimpin korporat itu uh, dipaparkan sebagai seorang yang begitu agresif, like super salesman. Tetapi sebenarnya majoriti pemimpin yang berjaya dalam bidang korporat mereka bukan begitu. Selepas memimpin beberapa syarikat terbesar di Malaysia, mengendalikannya ke arah kejayaan, saya ingin berkongsi pengalaman dan pandangan saya bersama anda. Kepimpinan pragmatik adalah ketika anda mampu menyingkirkan perasaan untuk membuat keputusan sukar berdasarkan fakta yang nyata. Saya telah marah siap buat tersebut, tetapi selepas saya menaikkan nada saya, I felt so bad. Untuk mereka yang mungkin lahir dalam keluarga yang serba kekurangan, bila mereka diberikan peluang, mereka boleh dilatih untuk menjadi seorang yang berjaya juga. So, leaders are basically made, are not necessarily born. Inilah diri bersama Abdul Wahid Omar. If I'm doing my current job very well, I should be promoted. Someone would come to me and say that, why haven't you promoted me yet? Didn't I complete all these things very well? What people don't realize is, doing your current job very well is great, but if you want to get promoted, you need to do the next job very well. You need to kind of think ahead a little bit. Even if you're not managing right now, you actually have to be able to take on some managerial responsibilities or to display some leadership responsibilities that is beyond the scope of your current role before you can get promoted. And this messaging has to be very clear, even at the HR level, the culture level, at the management level, that everyone understands this. Like if you want to grow, doing your current job well is, is great. You know, you keep your job, but you need to do the next job well. And once you're able to do the next job well, then you're considered for growth. Right, you sort of only get promoted when you can demonstrate that you are ready for the promotion. You don't get promoted just because you do the previous job very well. And this mindset is important for HR to instill in their employees. Entrepreneurs love challenge. They love to disrupt. They set high standards. They push the envelope. They take a guy from the music business who has no experience and buys an airline for one ringgit with a few partners to go out there and change aviation forever, to start with two planes and end up with 205 planes. And you don't have to be an entrepreneur to think big. You don't have to start your own business to think like an entrepreneur. No such thing. An entrepreneurial mindset is the difference between guys who want to be at the top who want to be winners and people who just want to have an ordinary life. I wasn't born out of my mother's womb as an entrepreneur, but I always pushed the envelope to try and achieve the most of wherever I was. But let's go back to my first job. When I was uh, in Warner Music, a lowly accountant in the basement of Warner Music International, they were doing reports that were, frankly, I didn't believe anyone was going to read. And I went to my boss and I said, look, you pay me a good salary. I want my work to make a difference. You can take two attitudes. You can just take your salary and do what everyone was doing, or you can try and be better and make a difference. But my boss basically said to me, nope, this is how we always do the report and don't change it. And so rather than moan about it and take someone's salary, I changed. So I went out and bought some software, which none of you would ever heard of because I'm 59 years old, called Harvard Graphics and Lotus 123, which was kind of a Microsoft Excel, actually. I redid the report. I changed it. I used graphics. I brought the, the report to life with real examples. And I sent that report up to the bosses. And I thought either I was going to be made a hero or I'd be fired. And there was no in between. I came in in the morning, the next morning, and I saw everyone looking at the, their computer screen, all my colleagues. And I went over there and looked at them and thought, what are they, what are they reading? And they were reading my report. And I thought, uh-oh, either I'm toast 
or this is going to make my career. I asked my colleague, why are you looking at my report? He says, the chairman of the company says it's the best ever report he's seen and he wants to meet you. And so I knew that risk, that, that thinking big had paid off. And I remember I was 23 years old, first effective job, but I still felt that I needed to do something that made a difference. And I think that's the first lesson. If you're gonna take a career and a job, be the best at that job. Put in 100% into whatever you wanna do. Disrupt. And this is the early stage of Tony Fernandez as a disruptor. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazir Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. The state of innovation we are behind, generally, because if you think that what are the exciting things that are happening in the world right now, is Malaysia leading in any of those? We don't lead in those, in that, in that thinking. People fear innovation if they don't fully understand what its ramifications are. There will be obstacles. So there's the battle at many fronts. Things can happen and there will be collateral damage in any battle. And you could be that collateral damage, which is why if you are thinking of taking the innovation path, you have to be determined. You have to believe strongly in what it is that you are trying to achieve through this innovation. But there is one word sometimes people forget you must also be courageous. You need to be brave to say, I will uh, take this path. And it hurts here and there. There's bitterness and sweetness, but you must have the courage to achieve your ambitions of innovating. It's not easy to stand by your ideas and convince people of the innovation you want to execute. But that's exactly what you need to do to go against the dance. So please put your hands together and welcome Ms. Nicole Davis. Staring into space almost, you know, just thinking about what she's about to do again on court. It doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve, what you want to do in your life. You just can't give up. It's not that cool, boast. Is this the end? It is. And that's game, set and match to the 21-year-old Nicole David from Malaysia. Well, there really isn't any guide to being world number one. Even at world number one, I knew I had room for improvement. I had to think that I was number two all the time because being number one is not something that is yours. It's something you have to gain every month. I've lived it, I've experienced it, and I hope that all the journeys I've taken through in my squash career can really help you in your own life, in your own journey. In this course, I'll be covering the mental resilience it takes for anyone to be on top of their field, building routines and habits that will lead you to the results you want, how I deal with failure and keep on going, 
everything that I'm going to share with you in this course is what works for me. But now I want to help you to find what works for you. I'm going to help you fulfill your full potential. This is Deary with Nicole David. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazir Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. We went scriptless. That was when I actually had my first experience of um, conducting a separation exercise. Jobs were redundant already. We couldn't upskill or reskill them because this was entirely a different skills that were needed. That first voluntary separation exercise was so painful. How do you tell, you know, um, the staff who have been loyal to you, who have been working so hard for you, that your job is gone. I had sleepless nights, I remembered, but I then realized that the Malay saying, you know, rezeki sampai di sini, you know, and this is it, you know. Uh, let's do what we can to help them. And that was where I helped out to secure other jobs for them outside CIMB. So we helped them with uh, interview skills because many of them would not have gone for interviews before. We help them to prepare the resume and in fact we also prepare help them to send their resume to other companies and it went down very well and I still remember one who actually who got promoted in the job and said that you know without realizing it he could do um, something else besides then just uh, stop broking filling up transfer form and all that. But that taught me a lot, you know, that um, we can actually ease the transition when we handle any, in any of all these uh, separation exercises. I had to MC a corporate dinner, yeah. and the theme of the dinner was paint the town red. Mm. Okay, so naturally, everybody in the audience came dressed in red. And you know Malaysians lah, you know Malaysians, we all a bit flaky sometimes. Sure, got jersey on menu, yes, Liverpool, yeah. correct. Yeah. And you know, I'm a football guy, I'm a Liverpool <laughs> guy. So, I went, naturally, I went and spoke to the Liverpool people lah, because they're my, my guys, you know, yeah. the same supporters club, right? So, yeah, I spoke to them and uh, found out more about the event, why they're having the dinner, when was their last dinner, you know, all these things matter. Ni untuk saya tahu cara saya nak kendalikan event tersebut. Bahasa macam mana yang saya nak bercakap. Adakah right. uh, diorang ni lebih kepada urban crowd? Do they speak English? Do they yeah. speak Malay? What kind of Malay do they speak? Correct. Sebab sometimes kita punya crowd ni bercakap hanya mungkin dialect Kelantan. Jadi saya akan cuba adapt lah. Kecil kelati ya. Kecil lah. Uh -huh. uh -huh. hey, okay. wait, what? Not bad lah. Eh, hey, not bad. <laughs> so in other words, if you are a young 20-something year old about to present to like some C-level executives, chill. Don't say basin, you know, don't use your, your TikTok language. You apa know. cita bro? <laughs> Ni semua jangan lah. Slay queen, don't say that. Yeah. But you can use apa cita bro if it's an 
event where everybody is sort of just like you, yeah. you know, amongst friends, put on the presentation macam tu. Right, yeah. Sure, use that. Know your audience, know how to present. Now, yang tidak boleh dikawal, forget it. Yeah. Maksudnya, kalau it's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh-uh. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazir Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Alhamdulillah, saya dilahirkan sebagai anak yang ke-9 daripada 11 orang adik-beradik. Ayah saya, Haji Omar, dulu bekerja sebagai seorang penyelenggara store ataupun storekeeper di Singapura. Ibu saya merupakan seorang pengurus rumah begitu baik sekali. Pada satu pagi, saya telah mendapat surat daripada Mara yang menawarkan saya masuk ke MRSM. Saya memang excited. Uh, ini memang satu impian saya uh, untuk uh, pergi ke sebuah sekolah berasrama penuh. Uh, tetapi ayah saya ketika itu bertanya balik soalan kepada saya, uh, memberangkan jumlah yuran-yuran yang perlu dibayar, uh, bagaimanakah uh, kita mampu uh, untuk uh, membayar yuran tersebut. Uh, jadi ini telah memberikan uh, merupakan satu keadaan yang sedih bagi saya. Uh, tapi Alhamdulillah telah um, ayah dan ibu berbincang, mereka telah uh, bersetuju untuk meminta bantuan daripada ibu dan bapa saudara dan Alhamdulillah mereka uh, telah membantu uh, untuk uh, dapatkan uh, jumlah wang yang mencukupi uh, untuk membayar yuran tersebut. Uh, dalam keadaan semua kekurangan, memang ada saja orang yang uh, sunim membantu. Ini yang kita katakan resilience. Uh, you must have the ability to uh, sustain, pursue what you want to pursue, and when there are challenges, review what you have, make whatever adjustments necessary, and proceed with uh, something better, insyaAllah. Change is a given. You will definitely face this in your career. The question is how you respond to them. How I navigated my early years would be very relevant. I think almost anybody, be it young executives, fast rising career aspirants, the young CEOs, when you've completed the course, you will take action at work. Better compound on your strength, have better career prospect. I will cover the corporate world, its in and outs, and how someone should navigate it, how to better balance short-term and long-term goals, and understanding the mindset of CEOs. I will share how I was able to identify opportunities and take advantage of them, and some of the actions I took to scale Malaysia's leading banking group. Leadership is exciting. I loved it, and you should love it. This is Diri with Nazir Raza.
kita mungkin sering melihat uh, dalam movies di mana seseorang uh, pemimpin korporat itu uh, dipaparkan sebagai seorang yang begitu agresif, like super salesman. Tetapi sebenarnya majoriti pemimpin yang berjaya dalam bidang korporat mereka bukan begitu. Selepas memimpin beberapa syarikat terbesar di Malaysia, mengendalikannya ke arah kejayaan, saya ingin berkongsi pengalaman dan pandangan saya bersama anda. Kepimpinan pragmatik adalah ketika anda mampu menyingkirkan perasaan untuk membuat keputusan sukar berdasarkan fakta yang nyata. Saya telah marah siap foto tersebut, tetapi selepas saya menaikkan nada saya, I felt so bad. Untuk mereka yang mungkin lahir dalam keluarga yang sebab kekurangan, bila mereka diberikan peluang, mereka boleh dilatih untuk menjadi seorang yang berjaya juga. So, leaders are basically made are not necessarily born. Inilah diri bersama Abdul Wahid Omar. If I'm doing my current job very well, I should be promoted. Someone would come to me and say that, why haven't you promoted me yet? Didn't I complete all these things very well? What people don't realize is, doing your current job very well is great, but if you want to get promoted, you need to do the next job very well. You need to kind of think ahead a little bit. Even if you're not managing right now, you actually have to be able to take on some managerial responsibilities or to display some leadership responsibilities that is beyond the scope of your current role before you can get promoted. And this messaging has to be very clear, even at the HR level, the culture level, at the management level, that everyone understands this. Like if you want to grow, doing your current job well is, is great. You know, you keep your job, but you need to do the next job well. And once you're able to do the next job well, then you're considered for growth. Right. You sort of only get promoted when you can demonstrate that you are ready for the promotion. You don't get promoted just because you do the previous job very well. And this mindset is important for HR to instill in their employees. Entrepreneurs love challenge. They love to disrupt. They set high standards. They push the envelope. They take a guy from the music business who has no experience and buys an airline for one ringgit with a few partners to go out there and change aviation forever, to start with two planes and end up with 205 planes. And you don't have to be an entrepreneur to think big. You don't have to start your own business to think like an entrepreneur. No such thing. An entrepreneurial mindset is the difference between guys who want to be at the top who want to be winners and people who just want to have an ordinary life. I wasn't born out of my mother's womb as an entrepreneur, but I always pushed the envelope to try and achieve the most of wherever I was. But let's go back to my first job. When I was uh, in Warner Music, a lowly accountant in the basement of Warner Music International, they were doing reports that were, frankly, I didn't believe anyone was going to read. And I went to my boss and I said, look, you pay me a good salary. I want my work to make a difference. You can take two attitudes. You can just take your salary and do what everyone was doing, or you can try and be better and make a difference. But my boss basically said to me, nope, this is how we always do the report and don't change it. And so rather than moan about it and take someone's salary, I changed. So I went out and bought some software, which none of you would ever heard of because I'm 59 years old, called Harvard Graphics and Lotus 123, which was kind of a Microsoft Excel, actually. I redid the report. I changed it. I used graphics. I brought the, the report to life with real examples. And I sent that report up to the bosses. And I thought either I was going to be made a hero or I'd be fired. There was no in between. I came in in the morning, the next morning, and I saw everyone looking at their computer screen, all my colleagues. And I went over there and looked at them and thought, what are they, what are they reading? And they were reading my report. And I thought, uh-oh, either I'm toast 
or this is going to make my career. I asked my colleague, why are you looking at my report? He says, the chairman of the company says it's the best ever report he's seen and he wants to meet you. And so I knew that risk, that, that thinking big had paid off. And I remember I was 23 years old, first effective job, but I still felt that I needed to do something that made a difference. And I think that's the first lesson. If you're gonna take a career and a job, be the best at that job, put in 100% into whatever you wanna do. Disrupt, and this is the early stage of Tony Fernandez as a disruptor. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazi Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Deary. This is Deary. Inilah Deary. This is Deary. This is Deary. Inilah Deary. This is Deary. This is Deary. The state of innovation we are behind, generally, because if you think that what are the exciting things that are happening in the world right now, is Malaysia leading in any of those? We don't lead in those, in that, in that thinking. People fear innovation if they don't fully understand what its ramifications are. There will be obstacles. So there's the battle at many fronts things can happen and there will be collateral damage in any battle. And you could be that collateral damage, which is why if you are thinking of taking the innovation path, you have to be determined. You have to believe strongly in what it is that you are trying to achieve through this innovation. But there is one word sometimes people forget you must also be courageous. You need to be brave to say, I will uh, take this path. And it hurts here and there. There's bitterness and sweetness, but you must have the courage to achieve your ambitions of innovating. It's not easy to stand by your ideas and convince people of the innovation you want to execute. But that's exactly what you need to do to go against the dance. So please put your hands together and welcome Ms. Nicole Davis. Staring into space almost, you know, just thinking about what she's about to do again on court. It doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve, what you want to do in your life, you just can't give up. It's not that cool, boast. is this the end? It is, and that's game, set and match to the 21-year-old Nicole David from Malaysia. Well, there really isn't any guide to being world number one. Even at world number one, I knew I had room for improvement. I had to think that I was number two all the time because being number one is not something that is yours. It's something you have to gain every month. I've lived it, I've experienced it, and I hope that all the journeys I've taken through in my squash career can really help you in your own life, in your own journey. In this course, I'll be covering the mental resilience it takes for anyone to be on top of their field, building routines and habits that will lead you to the results you want, how I deal with failure and keep on going, 
everything that I'm going to share with you in this course is what works for me. But now I want to help you to find what works for you. I'm going to help you fulfill your full potential. This is Deary with Nicole David. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazir Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Deary. This is Deary. Inilah Deary. This is Deary. This is Deary. Inilah Deary. This is Deary. This is Deary. We went scriptless. That was when I actually had my first experience of um, conducting a separation exercise. Jobs were redundant already. We couldn't upskill or reskill them because this was entirely a different skills that were needed. That first voluntary separation exercise was so painful. How do you tell, you know, um, the staff who have been loyal to you, who have been working so hard for you, that your job is gone. I had sleepless nights, I remembered, but I then realized that the Malay saying, you know, rezeki sampai di sini, you know, and this is it, you know. Uh, let's do what we can to help them. And that was where I helped out to secure other jobs for them outside CIMB. So we helped them with uh, interview skills because many of them would not have gone for interviews before. We help them to prepare their resume. And in fact, we also prepare, help them to send their resume to other companies. And it went down very well. And I still remember one who actually, who got promoted in the job and said that, you know, without realizing it, he could do um, something else besides then just uh, stop broking, filling up transfer form and all that. But that taught me a lot, you know, that um, we can actually ease the transition when we handle any, any, any of all these uh, separation exercises. I had to MC a corporate dinner. Yeah. And the theme of the dinner was paint the town red. Mm. Okay, so naturally, everybody in the audience came dressed in red. And you know Malaysians lah, you know Malaysians, we all a bit flaky sometimes. Sure, got jersey on menu, yes. Liverpool, yeah. Correct. Yeah. You know, I'm a football guy, I'm a Liverpool <laughs> guy. So, I went, naturally, I went and spoke to the Liverpool people lah, because they're my, my guys, you know, yeah. the same supporters club, right? So, yeah, I spoke to them and uh, found out more about the event, why they're having the dinner, when was their last dinner, you know, all these things matter. Ni untuk saya tahu cara saya nak kendalikan event tersebut. Bahasa macam mana yang saya nak bercakap. Adakah right. uh, diorang ni lebih kepada urban crowd? Do they speak English? Do they yeah. speak Malay? What kind of Malay do they speak? Correct. Sebab sometimes kita punya crowd ni bercakap hanya mungkin dialect Kelantan. Jadi saya akan cuba adapt lah. Kece Kelate lah. Kece uh -huh. lah. Oh, okay. hey, what, not bad lah. Hey, not bad. <laughs> so in other words, if you are a young 20-something year old about to present to like some C-level executives, chill. Don't say pasin, you know, don't use your, your TikTok language. You apa know. cita bro? <laughs> Ni semua jangan lah. Slay queen. Don't say that. Yeah. But you can use apa cita bro if it's an 
event where everybody is sort of just like you, yeah. you know, amongst friends, put on the presentation macam tu. Right, yeah. Sure, use that. Know your audience, know how to present. Now, yang tidak boleh dikawal, forget it. Yeah. Maksudnya, kalau it's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh-uh. Nicole David. Tony Fernandez. Nazir Raza. Abdul Wahid Omar. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Inilah Diri. This is Diri. This is Diri. Alhamdulillah, saya dilahirkan sebagai anak yang ke-9 daripada 11 orang adik-beradik. Ayah saya, Haji Omar, dulu bekerja sebagai seorang penyelenggara store ataupun storekeeper di Singapura. Ibu saya merupakan seorang pengurus rumah begitu baik sekali. Pada satu pagi, saya telah mendapat surat daripada Mara yang menawarkan saya masuk ke MRSM. Saya memang excited. Uh, ini memang satu impian saya uh, untuk uh, pergi ke sebuah sekolah berasrama penuh. Uh, tetapi ayah saya ketika itu bertanya balik soalan kepada saya uh, memerangkan jumlah yuran-yuran yang perlu dibayar uh, bagaimanakah uh, kita mampu uh, untuk uh, membayar yuran tersebut. Uh, jadi ini telah memberikan uh, merupakan satu keadaan yang sedih bagi saya. Uh, tapi Alhamdulillah, telah um, ayah dan ibu berbincang, mereka telah uh, bersetuju untuk meminta bantuan daripada ibu dan bapa saudara dan Alhamdulillah mereka uh, telah membantu uh, untuk uh, dapatkan uh, jumlah wang yang mencukupi uh, untuk membayar yuran tersebut. Uh, dalam keadaan sebuah kekurangan, memang ada sahaja orang yang uh, sudi membantu. Ini yang kita katakan resilience. Uh, you must have the ability to uh, sustain, pursue what you want to pursue, and when there are challenges, review what you have, make whatever adjustments necessary, and proceed with uh, something better, insyaAllah. Change is a given. You will definitely face this in your career. The question is how you respond to them. How I navigated my early years would be very relevant. I think almost anybody, be it young executives, fast rising career aspirants, the young CEOs, when you've completed the course, you will take action at work. Better compound on your strength, have better career prospect. I will cover the corporate world, its in and outs, and how someone should navigate it, how to better balance short term and long term goal, and understanding the mindset of CEOs. I will share how I was able to identify opportunities and take advantage of them and some of the actions I took to scale Malaysia's leading banking group. Leadership is exciting. I loved it and you should love it. This is Diri with Nazir Raza.
cerita mungkin sering melihat uh, dalam movies di mana seseorang uh, pemimpin korporat itu uh, dipaparkan sebagai seorang yang begitu agresif like super salesman tetapi sebenarnya majoriti pemimpin yang berjaya dalam bidang korporat mereka bukan begitu Selepas memimpin beberapa syarikat terbesar di Malaysia mengendalikannya ke arah kejayaan saya ingin berkongsi pengalaman dan pandangan saya bersama anda Kepimpinan pragmatik adalah ketika anda mampu menyingkirkan perasaan untuk membuat keputusan sukar berdasarkan fakta yang nyata. Saya telah marah siapa tersebut, tetapi selepas saya menaikkan nada saya, I felt so bad. Untuk mereka yang mungkin lahir dalam keluarga yang serba kekurangan, bila mereka diberikan peluang, mereka boleh dilatih untuk menjadi seorang yang berjaya juga. So, leaders are basically made and not necessarily born. Inilah diri bersama Abdul Wahid Omar. safe and sound. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the unveiling of Deary, realizing talent potential through homegrown stories. And to those of you watching on live stream, hello to you too. Now, before we begin, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Maggie Wang. It's my absolute pleasure to be your host for this first part of this morning's program. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Today is a very, very exciting day as we will be witnessing the unveiling of something truly remarkable and, of course, transformative. And, of course, we all know why we are here today. It is to unveil Malaysia's first premium edutainment streaming service dedicated to self-improvement. And, of course, I personally, before coming on to this event today, I had the privilege of immersing myself into the lessons of Deary as well. Of course, I had to check it out, right? And particularly those by our esteemed guests, Tanstri Nazirazak. Um, I couldn't stop. 
I went on and on, episode after episode, and all I'm going to say is, without giving you any spoilers, although you already saw some of our snippets earlier, it will be a game changer, especially for myself who's still learning about life. I mean, as long as you live, you learn. There's just so much for you to discover and, of course, to hear from the unique stories from each and every of your mentor who also happens to be our nation's best. And I cannot wait for you to experience it yourself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, it is an honor to introduce Deary's co-founder, a man deeply committed to advancing education and personal development in Malaysia. Please join me in welcoming Tunku Ali Redhalden Ibni Tuanku Muhris. Thank you, Maggie. That was great. Um, and you, you said a couple of things that I wanted to say as well. So that, that's really wonderful. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And good morning. It's a bit bright. I guess that's the way it works. I can't see you all. And I guess you can sort of see me, hopefully. Um, welcome to Diri. I'm truly honored to be standing here in front of all of you esteemed mentors, partners, distinguished guests, members of the media. Particularly thrilled to see, uh, having walked outside just now and have met a few of you, uh, representatives from corporate Malaysia as well as from educational establishments. Uh, your presence means a lot here today and really reinforces the significance of what we're trying to achieve through DIRI. As Maggie said, I've always believed in the importance of learning. To me, education is more than just about acquiring knowledge. It's about developing a mindset to navigate the complexities of our world. And I've been privileged beyond my own education to have been involved in a number of educational institutions and initiatives, both within and outside of Malaysia. So Teach for Malaysia, Excel Education, University of Science Islam, IMU, APU, and UKM. I think some of you are in this room. Give a shout out, please. Woo. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. These institutions, along, many others, contribute significant, along with many others, contribute significantly to the development of our country, including helping people prepare uh, to enter the workforce. Indeed, our nation's progress is tied directly to the quality of education we provide, and the more effectively we educate our people, the higher we will collectively soar. That said, Education, as Maggie said, does not end with a certificate or a degree. We must always continue to learn, and our, you know, our educational establishments also recognize that. But with this in mind, when I was introduced to Diri by uh, Tunku Morris and, and Sheng, I immediately recognized its value. Diri introduces a different paradigm of educational delivery, one that harnesses the power of storytelling, mentorship, and continuous learning packaged in a form that is lively and enjoyable. But DIRI is not just a platform, it is a movement. A movement dedicated to equipping Malaysians from high potential performers to young executives, first time job seekers, and whether you've had the opportunity and the doors open for you or not, um, to, have an ac to have access to this great platform. We aim to foster life, leadership, and management skills that transcend conventional learning. At the core of Diri's philosophy is the power of storytelling. Stories are more than narratives. They are tools that engage, inspire, and educate, connecting with learners on a deeper emotional level. Through Diri, we use this power to make learning with us relatable, impactful, and enduring. All of this is done together with our mentors, some of whom are present here today. Ladies and gentlemen, I was very lucky uh, early in my career, I think it was about 25 years ago, and as a fresh graduate and analyst uh, at McKinsey and Company, to have attended a meeting at Amanah Capital, where I was super impressed by the young general manager who was asking all these uh, very incisive questions uh, and making all these great observations. And I thought, coming out of that meeting, wow, that guy is, is really impressive. Uh, that gentleman went on to uh, play significant roles in UEM, uh, Telecom Malaysia, Maybank, and as a, as a minister in the government. Uh, and then 
uh, as, a, as the chairman of PNB, um, uh, as an Uber driver, amongst other things, as, as now the chairman of WWF, but most importantly, as a mentor of Diri and uh, Tantri Wahid Omar, someone who has mentored me uh, and I've known for 25 years and has uh, contributed, well, I, who I've learned a lot from, and I'm so privileged to be able to work with him, not just on Diri, but on other initiatives as well. Thank you, Tantri, for being part of Diri. I was also fortunate, uh, right at the beginning of my time working at Kazana National, back in 2004, to have met uh, uh, or interacted and worked with uh, uh, a leader in the Malaysian financial industry, Tanstri Naze Raza, who we worked, uh, and we worked together on many things uh, when I was at Kazana, as, and I learned a lot from him. Um, at the time, CIMB was, uh, was an investment bank, uh, uh, or just an investment bank, can I say just? Um, and over that period, it had transformed itself into a universal bank and then in, in a, a regional economic powerhouse. Um, all of that done under the leadership and deal-making skills of Tantri Naze, and I was glad to have learned from him throughout that journey. I'm very privileged that he is also part of Diri. Thank you, Tantri Naze, for being part of this. Tantri, I know you have a big day tomorrow, so glad you are here today. Uh, hopefully, this will be just as memorable. <laughs> um, whilst I've not had the same level of interaction, um, you know, I've always admired Tansri Maslan Osman, who, by the way, is an Anna Nogori like myself. So, uh, shout out Nogori Smilan. Um, and I've always admired the pioneering work she has done in advancing the sciences, including space exploration in the country and the leadership role she's played in the UN as well as nationally. So, thank you, Tansri Maslan, for being part of Diri. The, the same can be said for my admiration for national sports icon, Dr. Nicole David, who also for, follows spherical objects, albeit in a very different space. Over the years, I've had the privilege of seeing her play and meeting her on various occasions. And whilst I'll leave the squash court engagements to my brother, I'm happy to be able to work with her on Diri. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nicole, for being part of this. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I've had the great and tremendously fortunate opportunity to have interacted with a lot of today's mentors, uh, with all of them in fact, uh, and have been able to learn with, from some of them over the course of many years. Now through Diri, everybody can too. So thank you mentors for being part of Diri and for sharing your knowledge and experience with the rest of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, in an era, in an era of constant change, the skill is tomorrow. At Diri, we are committed to staying ahead of the curve ensuring our, lead, our learners are equipped with the knowledge and mindset to adapt, evolve, and thrive. Our focus on corporate Malaysia is just the beginning. Diri has the potential to revolutionize learning for diverse groups. We envision a future where every Malaysian, regardless of their background, will be, will be empowered to think critically, solve problems creatively, and adapt to ever-changing circumstances. Looking to the future, we're committed to being an integral part of Malaysia's growth. We are not just educators, we are partners in nurturing the talent that will strengthen our nation. The road ahead is filled with opportunities for new courses, collaborations, and innovations. And Sheng will talk a bit about this uh, after this. I, I just want to record my thanks. I'm Im uh, immensely grateful to our dedicated team, inspiring mentors again, and of course, our early adopters who have embraced the vision of transformative learning. Your engagement today will significantly influence our growth and expansion. I invite each of you to join us on this transformative journey. We've prepared a great program that involves our mentors, which I hope you will find insightful. Whether as learners, mentors, or advocates, your role is crucial in shaping a brighter future with Diri. Menuntut ilmu sepanjang zaman, pengalaman adalah lumrah kehidupan. Mendidik masyarakat berdasarkan kisah tauladan, agar berdiri pegah di pentas kejayaan, Let's stand together. Mari kita berdiri bersama-sama. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you so much, Tunku Ali, Red Hout, and Ibni, Tuanku Mouris. Those big, big hand, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, our journey today takes us into the heart and mind of another visionary, someone who's been instrumental in shaping Deary into what it is today. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome the founder of Deary, Sheng Wang, for his keynote presentation. Hello, hello. Um, can everybody hear me? All right, good. Um, okay, I'm just going to go through the formalities. Yang Ahmad Mulia, Tunku Besar, Seri Menanti, Tunku Ali Red Wan, Ibni Tuanku uh, Muris, co-founder of Diri. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Datuk Sri Abdul Wahid Omar. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Mazlan Binti Othman. Yang berbahagia, Tan Sri Muhammad Nazir bin Tunku Abdul Razak. Um, Yang berbahagia, Datuk Hamina Naziadin, who unfortunately can't make it today, uh, but I'm very sure she's tuning in on live stream because she just messaged me just now for a link. So, hello, uh, Datuk Hamida. <laughs> Yang berbahagia, Datuk Nicole and David, and Tan Sri, Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, Datuk Sri, Datuk Datuk, esteemed partners, Christopher Ng, Morris and Jay, members of the media, distinguished guests, and everybody tuning online. A very good morning, and I'm so happy to see everybody being able to join us here today for our launch of DIRI. Um, a very good welcome. It's great to see so many leaders and team managers or uh, talent managers and learning specialists here with us today uh, because I think a lot of you have a very big responsibility of the education and the development of a large group of people. And in another lifetime, I had that small responsibility as well. Um, what seems like a lifetime ago, I used to run a digital agency. And back then, um, I had like, a team of 30 people. They were like from all walks of life. So I had people who came from large agencies that spoke all the lingo. And then I also had like graphic designers and I had coders that basically didn't, mostly didn't have degrees. They came from rural areas and whatnot. So I had to find a way to sort of like make sure that everybody speaks the same lingo. And I think like a lot of managers like you guys today, I went online, I looked for a training program that would fit my specific use case for my local context, for my local clients. But after going through, I think the frustration is there and I couldn't make it. So basically what I had to do was, I had to conduct the training myself. So I had to do after work hour trainings for everybody in my organization. So. A bit noob, lah, right? Because the uh, first time training and whatnot. So I basically came in with 50 PowerPoint, uh, 50 slide PowerPoint decks uh, with concepts and techniques and things like that. And my first lesson teaching it, uh, you can see everybody start to lose interest. Second lesson in, uh, people's phone started to come out already. There, there was Instagram, people surfing Instagram and things like that. Uh, yeah, I think much like some of you guys here right now. So, <laughs> but yeah, then there was also uh, by the third by the third time I was doing it already, I felt a bit desperate because it was like me constantly just instructing, talking on uh, talking towards them, and it didn't feel like it was very personal. So that was actually when I just tried something new. I literally just pulled a chair out, sat down right in front of them, and. I just walked them through one of my days, which was me handling a client and how it had a problem which I overcame and we sort of developed the campaign for. And then it just felt like me sharing a story. And that's when they actually started to engage back as well. So the whole training for the third time was basically just me talking and then them balancing back. And thankfully, like nobody was playing on their phone that much, lah, right? But yeah, so, so from that point on, that's basically how I conducted my trainings. It was just my team, me in a chair, and yeah, that's a lot of what actually inspires Diri as well. Uh. So without me knowing, actually, uh, I kind of went through what I think corporate Malaysia right now is facing, uh, especially with talent development, which number one is that diverse routes requires diverse learning paths. Number two, rapid changes actually requires constant upskilling, and that's a problem. And number three is that it is super difficult to gain attention today. 
because of TikTok, because of Instagram, because of the phone that everybody has inside their pocket. So, when we actually form Diri, oh, sorry, for most of you, I think everybody here should know already what Diri is about, but for those of you who don't know, Diri is actually an e-learning platform that skews more towards being something like a Netflix than it is your conventional slide-based uh, e-learning courses. Right? So we work with Malaysia's best, develop courses specifically tailored around them, and, be, and actually we actually put that course through a movie-making process so that it's both entertaining as well as, more importantly, educational as well. Right? So in a nutshell, that's what Diri is. Um, when we started Diri, there were four main core pillars la, that we built it upon. And uh, coincidentally, uh, our logo actually reflects that as well, uh, having the four core pillars. And pillar number one is actually that we have to resonate first, then we teach. Okay? And so our courses are all built around a storytelling learning model. Let's say you wanted to train somebody to be a good leader. What are some of the aspects that you would want that person to go through? He probably needs to have strong integrity. He needs to probably learn how to build meaningful relationships. He needs to be able to leverage diversity, and he needs to learn how to implement strong change. Right? So this might be a course, a typical course structure for e-learning course, but with Diri, basically what we do is we weave it together with a very, very strong story. Because I think science has proven it already. We are humans. And we remember better when it's told in a story format because it builds emotional reaction. The stronger the emotional, the emotional reaction, the better we remember the better we apply, and also the better we engage with the subject matter. Um, so what kind of powerful stories can we tell? Well, it could come from a leader that basically is leading other leaders in a boardroom. It could come from the eight-time world champion of squash. It could come from a CEO who built a uh, a 60-man company to what, is, what was a 40,000-employee company. But those stories are powerful, yes. But you know what really is even more potent as a story? is when we all can actually relate to it as individuals. Both local, homegrown stories. Because behind all that, what you have is actually a typical Malay boy who came from rural part of Malaysia who went out of his way, got into MRSM, went through the system, worked hard, came out, succeeded, achieved his dreams of being a CFO, and then went a bit further some more to be the CEO of multiple public listed companies before now actually being a chairman. Right? That's a story that a lot of people in Malaysia can relate to. Or it could be just a girl born with an average family but a very loving family who overcame all the odds to achieve her dream of being world number one, not just once, but eight times. Another powerful story that a lot of us average Malaysians can relate to. Or, we have a, we have a young man who basically sucks at giving first impressions. right? And he always has to prove himself through second impressions, through his work ethics, through his actions, through the things that he does to prove his worth. Right? And I think a lot of us here can relate that it's very difficult to actually give a good first impression. And what lasts is actually how we conduct ourselves. So all those are stories that we as Malaysians can really resonate with. Those are powerful stories. And when it comes to stories, we don't really have to look far. These stories are all in our backyard already. Right? And we just need to tell them better so that we can teach better. Pillar number two is that we are all about teaching life lessons that stick. Just going to draw a very quick example. Basically, if, like, uh, if you're talking about 15 years ago, email marketing was the thing, and everybody had to go through an email marketing course. Then later on, search came about, and you could buy ads online. So it became having to learn about digital marketing. Not long after, straight away, social media became an advertising avenue as well. So everybody needed to equip themselves with social media advertising. Then after that, 
it didn't it didn't be okay that you just know about social media. You also need to know how they link together across platform. So everybody had to take omni platform marketing courses. And then now, especially today, with the rise of AI, marketers suddenly have to learn how to do automated marketing as well. Right? So the need to upskill is constantly there and it's getting shorter and shorter between when you need to upskill yourself. But if you really break down the fundamentals of what makes a good marketer, basically that person has to have creative thinking and he needs to have strong empathy because marketing is all about understanding your audience. That person needs to have clarity in communication in order to communicate his ideas and to have very strong teamwork because no good campaign is, is coming from just one person. It's a team effort. And that person needs to have curiosity and a mindset for experimentation because if he has that, it doesn't matter how the landscape of marketing changes, he will be able to be curious enough to learn and be experimentation, uh, experimentative enough to actually adapt. Right? So it boils down to actually three things. Mindset, soft skills, and quality of thought. So that's how we actually develop our courses. When you actually, uh, later when you have the degree account and you actually do dive in, basically this is how our course is like. Because it's personality led, right? We get to take a big topic, break it down into bite-sized chunks, and all we are doing is covering three things. How they think, how they acted, and how they grow. So these are timeless lessons. And yeah, basically every single one of our courses also come with a course guide. So you can really deep dive into it if it's not really covered into the video as well. So this is the, the thing. Like whenever we bring up Deary to, let's say, a lot of talent managers or leaders, the, the thing we always get compared to is LinkedIn Learning or Coursera. But we're not in the same space. In fact, I think what we are is actually complementary products in a case whereby here we are to entertain, get people used to online learning through stories and whatnot, and it serves as a guide to what you actually need to learn on platforms like LinkedIn and Coursera as well. Right? So that's basically how, how I think the ecosystem is. And then thirdly, basically education should also be entertaining. Right? Because Hollywood spends about 100 million a movie just to hold your attention for two hours, okay? And an e-learning course for about six hours, I don't, I don't think anybody ever puts in that much effort. Lah. But I think it's about time that those two worlds kind of merge together already. And basically, our storytelling model can be broken down into these five main uh, sorry, steps, which is basically we resonate first, we entertain to hold their attention, inspire, learn, and do so that they can ultimately become. That's our model. But we really, really focus on the entertainment aspect of it. Uh, we spend, so basically just like creating a movie, right? There's a few stages. In development, we spend months crafting the course, like creating the script, you know, and basically doing all the research we can to develop the courses with the mentors. Then we also have a pre-production stage where we have to do location scouting, we have to build a crew and everything, and basically get the mentors ready to be able to speak eight hours into a camera for multiple days because nobody, I think you all can attest, is actually trained to speak into a camera for that long, <laughs> multiple days. Uh, then after we have cost production. So our sets are basically like how you shoot a commercial or a movie. Lah. Um, 20 men running around, making sure the, the lights are okay, the sound is great. Uh, we've got directors on set and, you know, as you can see, uh, makeup artists and things like that. And then what we do is actually we put the whole duration of what we've shot through a movie making process. So if you were to go out there right now and ask a production company or an agency to actually recreate what we do, it would be upwards of about 300,000 ringgit per course. That's basically the kind of value that we are putting into each and one of our costs. Also, that we can create the best kind of courses for you. And more importantly, what we want to try and create is that one-on-one -on -one experience, whereby you feel like that person is talking directly at you towards the camera, and he's just sharing his stories, 
sharing experiences. So since we're all in a cinema, I wanted to give you all a first hand of what it would feel like to actually go through a typical d lesson. So I'm, we're about to play a video that is coming from Dato Nicole David's course, uh, Building a Champion's Mindset. And it's all going to teach us how to not give up in all those small moments and how that helps us out in our life. So guys, can we play that video now? It was the World Championships in Cairo in 2014 as the finals of the World Championships. The last match of the season to an opponent named Raneem Al-Walili. Will you please shake hands? Let's play squash! It's good. It's fantastic from Nicole. Oh, he's a great serve again. Oh. Oh. There's Nicole, she looks oh. like her legs have gone there. I was losing. 2-1 down, 10-6 match ball down, 4 match balls down, and she only needed one point to win. Earlier in the match, I felt that both of us were quite nervous, and we knew we were both just trying to figure each other out. And she started playing better and I felt that I was on the receiving end throughout the match. Awesome. Oh, what a shot. And then the pressure of these amazing shots she's playing and the whole match, I just was feeling like I was on the back of the ropes, like a boxing match. Even my team was thinking, oh, you know, it's going to be very difficult to come back from that point. But my coach told me in between the sets to make sure to just Keep to your game plan and not think of anything else. You can do this, keep to it, and you get there. And I just stuck to that game plan and just also had fun in the process. You try your best to have fun, but so many aspects are coming in. The expectations of winning, the expectations of wanting to play your best squash. And I realized that I needed to step my game up. I knew I had to fight my way through Deep down inside of me, I knew I had that chance. I had seven world titles backing me and my opponent only had her first finals. So I felt that I would make the most of the experience that I got and I utilized it to my advantage. Four match balls! Four match balls! Everybody's excited round us here, Paul. Let's take you can't out. watch. Take out breath. This is massive. She bounced the ball and then she stopped and started to touch the side wall to just regroup herself. She hesitated at the serve. In that moment, I realised she needs to win this point, but I'm not going to let her do that. I'm going to win every point to that last shot that's being played. That moment just switched and I was in a zone. Automatically, I didn't realise what was happening around me. I just saw the ball and I told myself, follow the ball. Every single shot you see the ball, just run to it and get to it. And that's what I did. I was just hunting every ball down. She started to make mistakes. Oh, oh what a shot, Nicole. Nicole! A match ball! Unbelievable! Cross court, Nick, winner. I was seeing myself getting point after point till I got to her at 10 all. Ten. Ten old, little smile on her face. I'm not sure that's a grimace or a smile. And then it was just a deuce to two points to win that game. I mean, Nicole's such a champion, but you've got to feel for me. Oh, she'll rue the day if she loses this match. All those match balls. Come on, Paul, stay positive. So now, you have Nicole to has her first game ball. Unbelievable. Five points in a row from Nicole David. This is incredible. Oh, this is what champions are made of, though. He doesn't want to go for a fifth. That's a good shot. That's a good shot. Oh! That was a good shot. That was a great one. Fist pump from Raneem. First point for six points. Oh, Danny, this is, this is an immense squash. That's fine. Oh, oh. Again. Rami had five match balls, didn't he, and one. 11 all. You can hear the physical effort from Nicole there. 
Oh, that's oh, a great that's shot. A clever goal. shot. Where everyone else would have played a cross hall ninja, oh. played a little soft fade. Not hitting their marks now. It's a back, that's good length. That is a brave shot. Nicole must be getting tired, she's doing a lot of work. After what she's gone through, she oh. still puts it in there. 12 all. Ten. You can't blame her really, it was a tough yeah. rally. So, for Nicole David, the number one seed. It's hush silence now. Oh, well, she had it there. She just can't. Shot. Great squash. She's brilliant. Oh, she under pressure. Oh! oh! That was unbelievable from Nicole David. And I managed to win that set. And it was level at 2 all. And uh, the moment I went on that final set, I just took that confidence in and just brought it forward. And I didn't have anything that was holding me back. Keeping the hitting going, keeping the focus, not wandering with the mind, just hitting the ball like she does every single day, a familiar pattern. Just trying not to think of what's, that's her experience. And he's probably thinking more of the occasion. Nicole, more about the process. I'm sure she's nervous as well. I'm not saying it's easy. But she's been there. She's been there a lot. Raneem's not been here. And I got point after point after point only because I was focusing on that ball. I wanted to win that last point. That last two sets just felt like slow motion. I was in that moment just not letting anything go. I wanted to make sure that I fought for every point and I wanted to win that last point. Not her, but me. Nicole David, the 21-year-old from Malaysia. This is amazing if she wins this for her. This positive from Renee. This is for her eighth world title. Get it? And I won that match. And there oh, she's got my it! Word. How unbelievable! Come back from that. Every credit to Nicole. I feel so sorry for Renee. All those match balls, but let's not take it away from Nicole David. I won the world title and that was me to get lost in Cairo in front of her home crowd and it was one of the biggest comebacks that I ever did in my career. And now you know that this is coming to the end. Ladies and gentlemen, it's her moment. What a special moment. Remember all of those victories, all of the time she's been on this tour has been nothing short of magnificent. She is a great athlete. She is a wonderful ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, she's 2014 Randy Degler World Champion. Coming back from that moment was like the defining moment of being world number one for almost nine years at the time. No one actually imagined that I would make that comeback and the push to that very end made it all so much more meaningful and when it happened I was the happiest. I, I was actually um, super emotional afterwards. I was blubbering away and uh, my team was just there right by my side. Uh, also pretty shocked and amazed with the comeback and I still have to watch that match again to understand how I got through it. And frankly, I think afterwards, it just broke me completely because I used everything I got. I had nothing left and I just put it all in the squash court. And it, it really showed when I just broke down in tears. I was on the ground. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew that moment I was the World Open champion and I won my eighth world title. In life, I feel everybody have their struggles, their challenges. Everyone sees all the wins that I have and all the big 
titles that I've won, but nobody fully understands that when I do get to the finals, it's not an easy road. I will have to play matches in the first round, second round, quarterfinals, where it's five setters, it's closed, and I'm, I'm having to really dig deep to win those matches. Pretty much almost 70 to 80% of my matches are the ones that I have to fight back to, to get to where I need to be. The one thing that I always tell myself in these moments is when, just, you know, put, it, put your heart and soul into this last, last push. And if I have to die on court, I will, I will do that. And that's what I have in my mind. If I just go and run for every shot, if I don't give up, that's what matters to me. Because I've won tournaments previously, the edge I have over these players, they knew that somehow or another, I will find a way to come back. Even though I'm the number one seed, it doesn't matter. Everybody is just so relaxed. They get a chance to um, play their best squash with me because they know they have nothing to lose. So I'm there having to perform every single day at that moment. And if I am down, I need to find, figure a way to come back. And that, that was the difference. I felt that it doesn't matter what you're trying to achieve, what you want to do in your life. You just can't give up. Push through those moments because those moments will make you that better person because you actually overcome them. Those small moments that defines your ability to not give up because it all comes with a lot of work and you have to credit yourself that if you get through that work, if you get through all the struggles, the challenges, deep down you know that from that one obstacle that you broke through, you can do so much more afterwards. Whatever barriers that may come in your way, you can break through them and it's all part and puzzle of life. You, you need to, to go through these hardships to be successful. And then that applies to everything else. You can put it into your studying, you can put it into your workplace. I knew from a young age I didn't give up with my training because I wanted to improve and that just translated in different ways. I had reference to what I know and I applied it to something else. Thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. My team put a lot of work into uh, Dr. Nicole's course and uh, I hope it sort of hit all the correct objectives. Um, yeah, that's what I meant by, you know, education should also be entertaining. Uh. Um, so go going on to the last point, uh, the last pillar uh, of our theory is that actually why I find it so appealing to actually push for this initiative is that echoing what Tunku has said earlier, we really want to give access to the best and we want to do it for anybody who wants it bad enough. It's not just about corporate Malaysia or anybody that has a HR team looking after their needs. It's really about, you know, the fringe, the, the people out there who they having a one-on-one -on -one mentorship was never even in their imagination, something they never thought they could have. That's the true purpose of why DIRI needs to exist. And I think this is kind of like a shared responsibility. One, of course, is for the people who've already been there and be successful to want to give back in terms of courses and whatnot. Two is that, you know, my team, DIRI itself, will have to sort of strive to give, the better, best, give better courses along, along the time. But then again, I think it's also a shared responsibility between people who rely on that talent. Uh, employers, talent managers, corporate Malaysia in general. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead in the slide. <laughs> uh, basically, what we are going to do is we are going to make DIRI available to corporate Malaysia first. Uh, and that's why we are having a DIRI for business launch here today. Our next path will be to actually make it to lifelong learners. Uh, generally the public, and they will be able to buy the courses for themselves uh, very, very soon, which is probably going to be about end of December. But where we want to expand this out to is also making this available to maybe people like students and your first-time 
job seekers who maybe won't have that kind of budget to do it. So what we're hoping for is that we can do what we do at scale so that we can actually work with some people to bring down the cost for this group of people. And lastly, like I think where DIRI can really make a difference is as well is to the people who are underprivileged and people who require the second chances. So people who are either convicted or they probably retired but now want to come back into the workplace again. So these are the kind of groups of people that we hope to build and expand because if we do this and we focus on this group of people, actually our talent pool grows together as a nation as well. So it benefits everybody. And it all starts with Corporate Malaysia here today. So introducing Dairy for Business, what will you get when you actually uh, get Dairy for Business for your company? Well, basically the people who have the licenses will have access to our platform. Right, uh, and it's very simple. It looks like a stream, any other streaming platform. It's easy to navigate. You can go directly to your course, play it. If you want to binge watch it, you can binge watch it. If you want to watch it by episode by episode, you can, no problem. And then for every employer that signs on, they basically will get a dashboard as well. So from here, you get progress reports, things like your employee details, uh, how they have been progressing in their courses and things like that. Standard stuff. Then when... Uh, and I think from today onwards, what we're hoping for is to actually meet and understand what your use cases are. Because it's probably going to take at least two weeks for any of the companies here to be able to onboard on Diri, uh, mainly because of, I think, we, we've been through a couple already and we know that it, it takes a while to actually implement something like that in big companies. But starting from 30th of November, all your employees will also have access to three of our Courses. Uh, you already saw a snippet from Datuk Nico David's one. Then basically, Tansri Nazir's course will also be available as well as Tansri Wahid's course. Um, from that date onwards, every single month we'll be releasing two more courses for the rest of the year. So your corporate license duration will last 12 months, meaning to say by the end of your corporate license, you would have been be able to access 24 courses. And what you can expect from us in 2024 basically is that there are going to be more mentors. As we speak right now, so we are working with probably around 11 to 12 mentors on their course, and they are somewhere along the lines of that being done. Um, you've got people like uh, Tara Jacqueline, you've got people like Vivi Yusuf coming aboard, and then we also got a bit more fun stuff like cooking, uh, done by Shesun Lian, and uh, corporate wellness, taught by Kevin Zari, and there's a lot more corporate figures that are coming on board, of which I will share very soon. Uh, and we're also getting a lot of entrepreneurs in as well to share their story and journey. Um, what you can also expect will be new formats, right? So we will also be releasing shorter form stuff uh, where it's more of leaders on leaders. So you can think of it as CEOs talking to CEOs unfiltered and very raw. Or it can be CHROs talking to CHROs. Or it can also be executives, young executives talking to young executives, all sharing their problems and issues and stories for the benefit of everybody else. Then you can also, uh, we will also be providing new formats in terms of actual uh, audiences within the video. So it will be shot a bit like a reality show like that. And you can all look forward to this in 2024. And then lastly, uh, once we hit a certain number of courses already, we will be also releasing an app. So Diri will be available on uh, its distinctive mobile app as well. Okay, um, corporate use cases. So we've already experimented quite a few times and I think there's three main use cases that we can fit that will also cater to a company that is a wide range of sizes. So you have your instructor-led use case so meaning to say, if you already have teams of people that you conduct training for on a routine basis, what this corporate license will allow you to do is basically take our content and play it for your internal staff. So this allows you to actually incorporate all our videos into your training as well. Um, the most common method, uh, I think right now, that, that Diri is being utilized for is the hypo method. So if you have a high, high potential development track for your talents, basically this can be then put in as an add-on, right? So you give access to your high potentials, probably 10 to about 15% of your employee base. Or lastly, 
it's basically you can be treated as an employee perk or benefit. So you can make it available to everybody in your company as well. So that's the most outright easiest way to actually implement DRE. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so cost-wise, for basically our corporate license, if you're talking on an employee basis across a 12-month period, starts at around 49 ringgit per month per employee. But the more you onboard and more licenses you buy, basically it gets cheaper and cheaper. So at the tail end, if let's say your company is somewhere around 2,000 people, it can go as low as just 11 ringgit per month per employee. So it's really, really affordable and we try to make this as accessible to corporate Malaysia as we can because we want as many people to enjoy the content. But being here today, it is our launch and we wanted to give something special to everybody. So just for today, uh, if you were to book a consultation with us, basically what we will be doing is reducing that value from 49 ringgit to about 32 ringgit per month. And then at the lower end, from somewhere around 11 ringgit to right now, just 7 ringgit. Only, right? And how that works, okay, so what I would want you to, to sort of like take action on is, I think prior to coming in, maybe some of the, the staff have already uh, made you aware that we have this early adopter promo. So if you can take out your phones right now and you scan this QR code, what we, what we will send you to is our early adopter landing page of which you just need to fill out a form and book your consultation slot. It doesn't matter, uh, there's, no, there's no commitment or anything, but as long as you book your slot today, right, and of which you can actually reschedule within the time frame, and basically the time frame is between uh, 15 to, the, sorry, 17th of November to the 15th of December, you will be locking in your position for the first 100 companies that will be entitled to this package. And what it entails is basically giving you an additional six months on top of the usual 12 months corporate license. And again, it's non-committal, it, there's no obligations. If let's say we have that meeting already and it's not something interesting to you, then basically, you know, there, 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 there's no strings attached. Though. Okay? Uh, yeah, so that's basically what we are here to actually tell you, uh, you guys about. And like I said, lah, just drawing back to what Tunku has mentioned just now. We really want to give everybody access, and for us to do that, we need to be able to do things at scale. Uh, I'm damn fortunate to have met so many people that were so supportive of this initiative. My partners found great members of teams, and we all love what we're doing. We want to do it more, and the only way we can do that if, is if basically everybody in here is also supportive of the idea. If we do not support our own stories, no one will. So I hope you enjoy the upcoming talks that we, will, that we have for you guys today. And uh, thank you very much. A big, big hand, ladies and gentlemen, Shang Wong. Wow. I mean, how was the first episode? You guys saw the one with Dr. Nicole David. I was at the edge of my seat. I think I love that we got to watch it in a cinema, isn't it? Can you also give Dr. Nicole David a big, big hand, ladies and gentlemen? What a feat. So, so, so inspiring. And I think it's uh, truly a privilege to be able to get into the minds of our nation's best, really. Not something that we get to do all the time, isn't it? Like, we watch their matches, but we don't get to hear the story behind what really goes on. So I'm definitely going to check out the rest of it. But right now, as we reset, for the second part of today's program, I just also want to say um, a quick hello to some of the mentors who are here with us today. We have Tan Sri Dato Sri Abdul Wahid Omar's course on pragmatic leadership. We also have Dr. Hamida Naziadin, who's unfortunately not here with us because she's tested positive for COVID, but I'm pretty sure um, she's watching on live stream right now. Hello. And of course, make sure you check out her course on thinking like a chief people officer. We also have Malaysia's first astrophysicist, Tan Sri Dato Sri Dr. Mazlan Binti Othman's course on inspiring innovation at work. And of course, our eight-time world squash champion, Dr. Nicole David, on how to unleash your champion's mindset which you already saw an episode of. We also have Derek Toh. Um, Derek, where are you? 
Oh, there he is. We have Derek who has two courses on Deary, one for the HR folks or if you're a startup founder on employers branding and another one on building your ideal career path. And of course, uh, we also have while aiming for that leadership role, of course, don't forget to dress for success. So we also have that course with Fang Hing as well. And our favorite radio DJ announcers, Arno Lo and Hanif Hamza, on uh, connect effectively with the right audience. I feel like whether or not you are a presenter on stage, off stage, that is definitely a skill set that will come in very, very handy. Now, as you, as you can see, there is something for everyone. So I am so, so excited to see the ripple effect that you know, Deary will make in generations to come. Even just ge this generation, I feel like the impact is already so huge. So as I wrap up this first part of this morning's program, as you can see, the setup is already ready. I just want to say, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much for taking your time to join us this morning. And uh, right now, I'd like to just draw your attention to the QR code that you can find on your Deary ticket. So you can scan to register for the Deary's Limited Early Adopter Package that Shing has already walked you through earlier. Okay. I think it's time for us to move on to the next part of this morning's program where we'll be diving deep into discussion through the fireside chats here. But I will not be doing it, ladies and gentlemen. I will be handing over the mic over to the moderator for today, Tunku Demiri Petra. Please. Big, big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Once again, my name is Maggie Wang, signing off. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you hear me? Okay. Okay, um, introducing the guests. Uh, so thank you everybody. Oh, yeah, Tunko is right. You, I can't see many people here, but hopefully you can see me. Um, thank you everybody so much again for, for coming today. I, I'll get straight into this. We all want to hear essentially uh, uh, straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, um, from, from our guest today. So without due, further ado, allow me to introduce our, our speakers for today. So if we can introduce, please, uh, Tansri Nazir Razak on stage, Tansri Professor Mazlan Othman, and Tato Nicole David as well. Good morning, sir. Morning, morning. <laughs> it's space theme. It's space theme. The couple said, hi, morning, morning. <laughs> Okay, I, I don't think I need this. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for, for coming today. Um, we know that you all have very, very busy schedules. Uh, even after now, I think all three of you have engagements after this as well. So really do appreciate your time for, for coming in today. So, you know, without further ado, let's get this rodeo on the road, as they say. And... Um, if you allow me to actually start with you, uh, Tansu um, you know, if I can tap into your mind, if we are able to tap into your mind, you know, the, the, the thousand and one stories that you probably have, um, you know, probably, if your mind was a Netflix, I would probably subscribe to it as well, <laughs> if it was a Deary. Um, but the theme of, of Deary is about, you know, embracing change. You know, when you want to develop yourself, there's a reason why you want to develop yourself. Uh, you know, to grow with the times, to change with the times, to face on the challenge with the times. So, you know, out of the thousand one stories that you potentially have um, that you can share with us, can you share a time where, you know, in your time in 29 plus years as the leader of CIMB, um, embracing change, how did you go about embracing change? Uh, what were the things that you had to be aware of, um, challenges that you faced, and if there's any unique uh, anecdotes that you can share with us with regards to that? Yeah, uh, thank you, D. I mean, I think when you talk about change, I, I, I reflect that you know people talk about change very freely these days. Yeah? Yes, like, as an absolute necessity, and that, that's a sign of the times because change happens so fast. But if you dial back to when I started my career, you know, it, 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 the, the 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 saying was more like, "If you ain't broke, why fix it?" Yeah? <laughs> Correct. So change didn't wasn't so obvious. Uh, so when I became a CEO. Um, this was sort of, you know, uh, in 1999, uh, I became CEO. Uh, and I felt that we really need to cascade down the theme that change is the only constant. Yeah. So I came up with some of these uh, uh, terms, like change is the only constant. And I said that 
um, this, the worst saying in the English language if it's, is that the one I just mentioned, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Because we're all humans, we can always get better. Um, then I also bought, for everybody in the company, the company wasn't so big then, uh, everybody in the company, the book by Spencer Johnson, Who mm. Moved My Cheese? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and a really fantastic book and very, very simple to read. Even the tea lady got one. <laughs> okay. yeah, and, and, and so I thought that, that was the kind of ways that I cascaded down this notion that you know, change is a very important element uh, in the organization. Then, of course, <clears throat> there will be accentuated moments of change when um, you know, I came in, I decided that we had to change our business model. Mm. Um, you know, technical, but from, from, from merchant banking into investment banking. So we had to do things differently. I looked at the rest of the world and I said, investment banking is the winning model. This merchant bank, British, old British model is dying. Mm. Yeah, so then it's about telling everyone that, okay, this is the new order. Uh, and I made a lot of changes uh, in the organization. Uh, and um, we became you know, very successful as a result of the remodeling. Um, but cascading down uh, to everybody that, you know, teaching everybody how to do it. And it's not so difficult when it's, it's, yeah. it, uh, it's quite a small organization. Then the big one was uh, about six years later when I wanted to transition from being an investment bank to a universal bank. Mm. We needed to buy commercial banks. Mm. Uh, and that was tough because we were really successful. CIMB was by far uh, the leading investment bank. Then I had to tell everybody... We need to dispense with this business model. We need to uh, become universal bank. And this is where it's important if you want to push change uh, is to be able to explain your rationale, especially when you're doing well. That's very tough. Uh, everyone's like, hey, we, we, we're all doing well. We're all getting paid well. Why, why are you changing the model? So you have to go down and explain to everybody that this model, uh, as, as the way I look at the future, this model will die. Mm. Yeah, And then you know uh, 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 you need the... I guess the credibility, and I had the credibility to basically tell them, look, uh, believe me, yes. you know, we need to change the whole uh, the business model. So, uh, so that's another uh, example. And then, of course, when we bought Bank Boomi then, uh, we really needed people to change. Mm. Uh, so I did a few things. One was to create a reference narrative about myself. Uh, and I had a few incidents where I, I lost my temper and I almost strangled the staff. Uh, so that was important. So there's this reference narratives of this CEO who's, who really goes down to ground and gets very angry if you don't follow. Uh, and then I actually told everybody, okay, um, in the old days, you, everybody used to be paid the same mm. bonus, mm. right? Depending on the performance of the bank. Well, now you get zero yes. to unlimited, depending how you perform. Uh, and that kind of shook the system. So, um, but... 12% of the organization resigned. Okay, uh, but that's okay. actually what I wanted, so it's okay. Uh, but it scared it <laughs> down uh, that, you know, this is a time of big change. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. I heard, I heard one guy laughing there just now. Uh, hopefully that wasn't the person uh, that you were... <laughs> triggered his memories. Probably his son. <laughs> Probably the son there. <laughs> brilliant. So, no, I, so, so, you know, keeping, keeping to that, that narrative of, of um, you know, change is constant, and, and I like you said just now that, you know, don't fix things that are broken, but you know, essentially when you're already doing well and you're already top of your game, so to speak, why change? Why should we even pursue that? And you know, to, to, to both our, our other um, panelists here, this I think is really relevant as well to, to your history, but if I can bring it to yourself first, uh, Dr. Nicole David, I mean, eight-time world champion is no small feat, right? Uh, I think even Lewis Hamilton is only seven world champion or something like that, and they call him the GOAT. So you're doing, you're doing better than him on that front. Um, but, you know, just, just if you can just tap into your mindset into that. So, you know, first time winning, second time winning, but then what pushed you to go further? What was the mindset in that and embracing that, you know, you, the, the, the sports they are now in, you're changing, you're, you're the one that's now um, you know, forefronting it. Um, if you can just tap into your mindset to share with us. Um, in, the, in the very beginning, you, just, you start off as a kid wanting to win. And that was what I grew up doing. I wanted to beat my sisters first. And then it was then <laughs> being the best in Malaysia and then being best in the world. So it was all from that one initial point of just wanting to improve myself mm. and wanting to get better. And um, I was a world junior champion, a uh, two-time world junior champion. And then I moved out to Amsterdam to coach uh, at 18 years old. 
to be coached by my coach Liz Irving and she was a former world champion, very experienced and she and when I went there uh, I realized that I was still playing junior squash and wanting to be better in the in the professional tour and beating the top 10 players I needed to make big changes and it's not just small things I had to start from scratch mm. I, changing my technique, changing tactics, learning that this is not the way you move. You have to run in a different way and move around the court differently. So after like, achieving that at 18, and then you have to just break everything down and start all over again. So it was very tough. Uh, I needed to understand that she had the experience and I needed to just stick to the process and just make sure I just keep to it, even though it was very... Uh, uncomfortable, yes, yeah. I'm losing to people and that I don't usually lose to and it, I just knew that if you have like a leader like herself or, or you know like Tansri that knows what they're doing, you have to just work towards it and I, 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 I knew I was on the right, right path and four years down the line I won my first world title and that's when everything just clicked that when you get there, you need, you need to do unlearn and just learn new things mm. to just break through, through to the next level. Mm. And that's what I had to do. And, um, and I was so, so grateful for that change. And, and I just had to keep to it, make, make new, new plans, stick to working on improving those small things to just win that next tournament, now win the next world title, uh, make new goals. And when you do that and focus on those small improvements, then the performance, you're focusing on performance, yes. not just the result. So that's, that's pretty much all my career that I took in, that mindset of just knowing that if I can stick to it, Imp focus on that, just performing, focus on improving, and I will get the results, not the other way around. Thinking that you want the results, and then after that, not focusing on the steps to take mm. and the process that it has to go through, the, the hard work, the, the, the courage to just step up and know, yes, this is what I should do, and, and not, not, not go off the pathway. So that, that's how I managed to get through that nine years at world number one. Painful as it is, but it was. Um, but I didn't feel it was painful. I felt it was part of the deal. Just yes. having to work harder, having to find ways to just beat your opponent, learn from your competition. All these things is what I experienced, and I took it on and improved myself. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I can imagine it's being very tiring as well. <laughs> it was very tiring. It took it took a, a toll on me for sure. Yeah. I mean, having that mindset to constantly um, not only embrace change, but also recognizing the change. And, and I think Tansu Raza, Razak as well, you know, your 29 years career in CIMB, finance industry is probably one of the biggest things that's changed over the years and recognizing what that, that, what that means. Um, and I believe, you know, one of the things that you brought up just now was about the challenges that you face and how do you actually overcome those challenges. Um, so I would like you to then bring that conversation now uh, to you, if, you, if I can, uh, Tansri Professor uh, Maslan, um, about, about how do you actually then face these challenges in, in a way where, you know, you're often described as very inspirational as a very inspirational individual. In fact, even my mother, when she found out I was doing this today, she said, Demiri, please make friends with her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'll try. I'll try my very best. Um, but no, so like, you know, so you know, tackling it from, from a mindset point of view, shared by Dr. Nicole David, sharing it from, from a corporate point of view, um, but more as an inspirational, as an individual. Um, if you could share some stories that, that something along those lines have come out in your careers, uh, if you could share with us as well, please. Before I answer your question, I just wanted to say how inspiring this carpet is. <laughs> <laughs> you look down at your carpet, it reminds me of the poetry yeah. by William Butler Yeats, yeah. uh, amongst others. It says, the blue and the dim cloths of night light and half light. I will yeah. spread the cloths beneath your feet. And here it is. <laughs> and your old jacket hasn't escaped me either. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So cool. But so anyway, cool. Very cool. So you, you, you want me to share an insp story that inspires me, or I, where, I where, you, sure. where you where you would inspire others? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was lucky in the sense that 
uh, whatever I was doing was always new, you know, n and never been done by anybody else. And I could, at all points, you know, of uh, say any project that I undertook with the with people that I try to instill in them that you're part of history. You're doing something totally new that's never been done before. So I think um, it was easy in the sense of inspiring because the whole project was uh, mm. inspiring. And I think most of the things I undertook, like uh, building the first satellite or sending the first astronaut or setting up the first observatory, you know, yes, the, yes. All of that was um, always the first, and therefore quite easy uh, to convince people uh, that this is something that they can relate to and be part of uh, their lives, basically. Mm. That's, that's very, I mean, I, I, if, I, if you can just elaborate a little bit more as well, because uh, this will then lead to, to our second part that I want to talk about. Um, but essentially, you know, astrophysics, science, yeah. space, um, it's not exactly top of mind within Malaysian culture, if I can be, if I'm safe in saying that, course, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea of setting up a space agency in Malaysia, I'm sure you met with many challenges. Uh, I'm sure you met with a lot of people questioning the relevancy uh, of doing something like that. So beyond, beyond just those who you're working with closely, uh, but also, you know, in the general public, um, trying to convince and say, you know, this is something that we as a country, we need something we as Malaysia needs. Uh, if you can perhaps share anything along those lines as well. Yes, th this whole narrative about why we must go to space, believe me, it's something that in my space community, we have to do every day. Even the administrator of NASA has to do it on a daily basis, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah. Of course, they get $20 billion of <laughs> that, There's a difference. But, you know, whether you're in Nigeria mm. or NASA, you know, or in, mm. in the U.S., always somebody will question you why we should go to space. And then, of course, there's Elon Musk, who then spoils the whole market by saying... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and everybody asks me, why should we let the billionaire boys, you know, dominate um, all of space? So I think for everything that we do, we must always be thinking, what is that value proposition yes. to others? Yes. You know, uh, of course, to yourself, this, because you are committed to it, but to your, to your organization, to your colleagues, and luckily for me, always for the country. Mm. And eventually it was for the world because I went to the United Nations and I had to convince, uh, you know, nations um, mm. of the world why space is important. Mm. Um, and maybe that's what inspires me, <laughs> I don't know what inspires <laughs> people, um, to, to go be, to look beyond myself. Yeah. Um, so first I was looking uh, beyond myself, then beyond my university, then beyond my country, and then beyond, you know, go on to the, to the world stage. So Correct. that is where I think your approaches will be slightly different yes. and, uh, in the different parts of the story. But I think what inspired me all the time was because I was doing something new, you know? Mm. I was... Uh, trailblazing uh, <laughs> kind of thing. It was tough. Still very I, mean, much so. I can tell you that uh, when I was the head of the space agency for those four or five years, I aged 10 years, you know? <laughs> it was the bad part of my life, and sometimes <laughs> I think I can try to forget it. But um, it's the, the story, although I'm inspired, and I, I had to be inspired because it was very, very tough. So while yours was tough mentally and physically, mine was tough emotionally as well. Uh, people were attacking me all the time, mm, and mm. I had a boss imagine, who, yeah. you know, who was different from different. Um, it, so it was that emotional tenacity mm. that I had to have in order to keep going. Because you were asking, will people say, uh, will, say will people ask, well, not only will they question why we're we going to space, but even within the space community, I was doing new things. Yes. I, I, for instance, thought that the best way to solve our problems, Malaysian problems, is to take our satellite 
and put it at the equator instead of where everybody else was putting theirs. So nobody, you know, believed was, yeah, in what I, I wanted to do. Definitely. But that, that again, you know, so you had to unravel each of those problems and try to solve each one of brilliant, them. Brilliant, brilliant. And I think, I think we can just look at the recent moon landings from India, how that inspired oh, an yeah. entire nation of that. Yeah, um, but I think what the in, uh, Indian story tells you also that uh, never take space for granted. You know? <laughs> every launch is a gift from God. You know, every, a, a million and one things have to go right before you get that successful Definitely. launch. Elon Musk fails all the time. NASA fails all the time. Correct. And India, after the, all that big hype, in a sense, failed because this, the rover did not wake up. Wake up, yes. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> after all that Some effort. of us, some of the days. But, mm. um, yeah, so there is always that chance of failure. So you have to always measure your risks. Mm. And that's about, in all of my um, career, um, it's always about taking risks. Mm, mm, brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I, I, like to, I like to latch on two of those things you mentioned just now, the, the values that you bring uh, along with failures. And if I can direct back to you, to uh, Tan Nazir, um, you know, your, your role being, being in, um, as a leader, uh, corporate, corporately well known over the world, but now you've taken on a more mentorship role. Um, so you know, and rather now than leading is now you know mentoring, coaching, uh, sharing your thoughts, um, um, you know, discussing with your with your mentees. Um, so you're linking that to embracing also you know, uh, embracing losses, embracing uh, uh, defeats, uh, but at the same time, how do you? propose the value propositions, right? How do you increase the values um, or even share the values or recognizing the values um, that you have uh, with your mentors? Uh, how has that, um, you know, has that changed the way that you're, you're approaching with the mentors or are you still sticking with, uh, with how you were before? Um, perhaps you can share a little bit about your approach to, to mentorship. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do CEO mentoring for, for McKinsey and it's quite interesting that you know I, my first cohort were all CEOs from ASEAN, okay. uh, and then the latest cohort were from Mid Middle East and and, and Europe. Mm, uh, mm. And actually, many of the challenges are very very similar. Yeah, you know, we all say you know, uh, is it different? Uh, it's not really. Okay. Uh, mm. And in terms of the lessons I impart, it's really more um, my comments based on my, my experiences, um, and you know, answering questions that they have. Mm. Um, how I dealt with similar situations in the past. Uh, that's what I do. I don't kind of impose my values or whatever, because that's, that's really, um, I, you know, they, can, they, may, they don't even have to listen to me. <laughs> uh, I think what's important is just to share from my own experience, and if I put myself in their shoe, how I would deal uh, with that problem. That's how really I do my mentoring. Okay. And, I, and they're still keeping me on, so I think, okay. Like. <laughs> Must be doing something right. <laughs> well, the, my first three CEOs that I mentored, uh, uh, one quit, uh, one got sacked, uh, <laughs> only one survived. <laughs> well, I mean, there you go, right? Embracing change, and sometimes quitting, sacking, uh, those are the things that you actually need uh, to but actually Back to your grow. point about, about um, mistakes. Yes. Uh, and... and, and Stuff like that. Some of the best people uh, are ones that, that, that failed mm. in the past, and mm. that's very, very important. Two is this is a bit of a digression, but one of our biggest problems since uh, in the past five years uh, in Malaysia is, is, is that somehow or other um, we are very risk averse because we don't want to fail. Yes, yeah. correct. I think you know, this is very important. I always told, I, it's in my book, I said, look, I always look at my career as a net result. Mm. You know, in total, the good and the bad, mm. how did I perform? Mm. Right? But if always I didn't want to do any bad, I could not have done any, yes. much good. Correct. Right? And that's very important for people to understand. I mean, I remember when the PH 1.0 came in, right? Mm. When they came in, I, I noticed when they, wanted, they, they went against some of the CEOs, it was for that one mistake. They didn't yeah. bother about the fact there was 100 successes. Yes. They picked on the one mistake. Yeah. And I think that, that, that culture uh, is there now, that a lot of GLC CEOs and I are way too fearful of mistakes. Mm. And that's actually very dangerous to corporate progress here. Mm. Mm. 
Thank you. And and uh, speaking of failures, I mean, uh, Dr. Nichols, David, you you mentioned, you know, after you became junior world champion, um, having to change the way you work, you then started losing to players you previously previously lost to. Um, but sticking to to that notion of um, inspiring and 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 uh, uh, having those values, um, we're looking more into how do you actually now post your career, post your your um, professional career. You know, you now started the Nickel David Foundation, um, being an inspiration to, to, to younger generations, using sports as a manner of, of improving and, and, and um, just getting into these, these, improving the lives of these individuals. So if perhaps you can share a little bit about that as well with, with us. Yeah, um, firstly, it was pretty scary to <laughs> have a change of career, having to play all your life um, and being identified as a squash player to suddenly everything stops and it was quite a scary point um, at the end of my career, the two years especially. But when I was open to the possibility of, it, uh, of doing something more and trying to give back uh, with all that I've learned from my squash and just the values, the, the exciting experience that I encountered during my career, it was just nice to know that I can share it back to Malaysia and to our children and kids of the next generation of our country. So that two years before retiring officially, I already started well going through the emotional turmoil of getting rid of that identity of squash, which was painful. Um, <laughs> but then, um, but when I did that, and that process was quite tough, I let go of that squash mindset, but then use that mindset towards what's coming preparing myself for what's going to be, like be, speaking to more people, being ready to have my own foundation. And mm. by the time I retired, I was ready. I was ready to take on the next, next phase. But because sport has so much value, so much learnings that you actually use that and apply it to your, your lives. And I, I met a lot of great people along the way. Uh, my co-founder and CEO, uh, Mariana, she's not here, but she was one of the big uh, inf influences um, to open my mind to possibilities of having great things after my squash career. And, that, and, and she came on board to work with me to build a foundation. But when you have people outside the squash arena, they open your mind to what values and what learnings can be used and be applied to life, mm. because I was so engrossed in squash, and I didn't know how I would like face um, the real in the real world. And I could. I managed to now have my own foundation um, with with her, and we launched it last year uh, in June 2022. And it's been an amazing journey. Uh, the objective is to empower girls and boys through sport and education. And we, it's an after school program that we provide English tutoring classes and also squash um, training to kids lower uh, uh, to mid income families to just have an opportunity to learn about what these values are and um, that sport has to offer like discipline, confidence, and just getting resilient and being hardworking. All these things are their fundamental values that they are practically, le they are learning practical work in squash. And then you have English where it's more communicational. So we're, we are just building them for the future and building them holistically. So in that journey of putting that foundation together, um, I learn a lot. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a patience game. I never, I was so used to looking after myself, now I have to look after a team and, uh, and a team around me and also the, the kids. So you, you have to just take what I gathered as when in the environment that I had, that positive environment growing up, the positive environment that I built in my squash career, but now I want to translate that into the foundation. And now my team and the staff, my coaches, my teachers, also my, the kids, are all feeling that same environment, that positive environment, mm, mm. that encouraging atmosphere that we want to give them because it, we can't like, impose our values. But when we can set the tone yeah. and set the culture yeah. from the start, they feel it. They, they feel safe. They yeah. feel safe to grow up with their friends. They're not afraid. They're not being told, mm. like, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. 
but it's all about encouraging them just bit by bit and then it translates into your staff and when they feel that they know exactly what they have to do mm. to take it on board and I think we've done a great job uh, we have 114 kids right wow, now um, and still more to come uh, so I'm looking forward to what's in store for us fantastic thank you and I, I think I think that's the theme that the three of you have brought up is creating that environment um, that safe environment encouraging environment environment to dare to dare to challenge uh, and embrace that um, so you know we're just wrapping up here but there are a few questions from the audience if you allow me to to share and there's, there's a couple of questions here which are r roughly similar so um, both both for Tansri Maslan and, and Nazir um, these questions are similar so I'll ask it to both of you uh, but firstly you know one of the audience says uh, Tansri uh, coincidentally I also gifted the book who moved the cheese to everyone uh, in his team uh, as well as new joiners in previous company and really anyone who felt that would benefit from it. So fantastic book. Everybody, please do read that, uh, as well as Peak and Valleys from uh, Spencer and Johnson. Um, but the question that is similar to, to both of you is, you know, as a leader, um, how do you keep up the motivation and energy to continuously grow and change? Uh, how do you encourage uh, others to do the same? Um, so you know, with uh, Mazlan, more along the lines of, you know, how do you encourage them to take the risks uh, to innovate um, and, and, you know, be ready for failure? Uh, perhaps I can ask you first to, to answer that question. I, I like that you're asking me about risks because maybe this is not within the context of banking. But if you're doing science, I would say you have to go uh, stretch yourself to the furthest. And in fact... And this is what I do. And you're asking me, how do I motivate myself? I am a risk seeker. Okay. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Now, um, you know, often, oftentimes you have a risk presented to you, and you say, "Yeah, I'll take the risk." And it's a big job already taking a risk. But what I do is, I if I look ahead and see, is there anything that nobody wants to do, and, and, and something that you know, bound, doomed for failure to most people. Maybe I should be looking at that. And that's what I mean by being a risk seeker. Brilliant. And I think in science, if you do not do that, if you do not look for those new things, you know, that definitely might lead you to failure. And I, you know, I have to confess that I've, you know, I've had failures. But if you're not um, seeking those risks, um, then I think you're not stretching yourself. Okay. Well, you know. Thank you, thank you. And uh, no, no. I mean, I just add that. Look, you know, I always go back to the reference narrative. Okay. So, yeah. how does the CEO look at make his assessment of people? Mm. And this is where whether you lose a million ringgit for me or a billion ringgit for me, the real question is, was that a fair, a good decision that you made at that point in time, based on all the available information? Mm. Did you do enough research? Mm. Right? So yeah. you lose one million, you don't do enough research, you were very you know, slack, uh, yeah. then you're in trouble. Yeah. You lose a billion, but actually it was a good decision based on what we knew at that point in time, then mm. it's okay. Mm. Uh, I think that's very important. Okay. And you know, there's always risk. You mm. know, you, even when you, 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 you spot talent, right? It, you don't know whether they're going to perform or not. Exactly. Yeah. And my biggest, one of my most successful uh, talent spots uh, in, is outside CIMB. I remember one day a minister called me and said, look, I need uh, CIMB to sponsor squash and sponsor athletics. Mm. Uh, then I said, no, 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 I don't want athletics. I want that uh, squash because that's that girl. She's like <laughs> number four or something in the world. I think that one got potential. Ah, there yeah. we go. So this was my, 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 my claim to fame in terms of talent spotting. <laughs> Then you can, you can thank him later as well. For <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> for that. Um, so yes, we, have, we, have, we do have to wrap up this one here, uh, this call. So thank you so much to our three panellists here. Um, and, um, you know, truly is an honour to, to be sitting across the three of you with such high esteem. Um, and um, I, hope, I hope all of you please do take inspiration from, from, from their dairy videos uh, and look forward to, to looking at what they can share with you guys beyond what we have here. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for this. Oh, photo? Oh. Yeah? Where's the... Oh, okay. I know, close your eyes a little bit. Thank you.
Okay, brilliant. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you again to our, to our panelists here earlier uh, for sharing the inspirational, very inspirational stories. Um, you know, hopefully igniting, igniting for us to, to be inspired, to develop ourselves, to, to open ourselves up to, to, to fear. Because, um, you know, one of the things that does hold us back to development is, you know, what happened if I do my development and I don't succeed? Um, so how do I actually learn from this? How do I take away from that? So now moving on to our next um, uh, fireside chat. So, you know, we've heard earlier just now about inspiration. But now let's talk about, you know, you can talk the talk, but let's walk the walk. How do we actually start putting this into action? You know, how do we actually uh, see um, this actually taking place? Is it worth our time? Is it worth the investment? Uh, should I even bother thinking about this? Me as a leader, should I invest in my own team to grow with that? So without further ado, uh, do allow me to, to introduce on stage uh, Tansri uh, Abdul Wahid Omar and Dato Shaul uh, to the stage, please. Morning, morning. Thank you, thank you. Hi, morning, morning. Ciao, hi, yes. How are you? Brilliant. Uh, now I need to come a little bit closer, we get a bit more cozy. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, unfortunately, yes, we were supposed to have Dato Hamida uh, with us on stage today. Um, just to share with everybody, you know, when we were briefly introducing ourselves yesterday, um, uh, it did end up a little bit being a Maybank versus uh, CIMB <laughs> situation. So fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we won't see that so much today. Um, but no, Dato uh, Shahul, hopefully we will have you here as the... Uh, Lucky I was not there. So. <laughs> yes, the, we had the, fun yesterday. As a mitigator, thank you, yeah. Um, so, so you, I mean, you heard just now, uh, just, just before we actually get into, into your part, just like to hear your thoughts from, from our previous speakers. Um, you know, about inspiring, inspiring um, the, the, the next leaders, inspiring your team to develop. Just a quick two, two second thoughts about, about what they shared just now. If I can start with you, uh, thanks. Well, thank you, Demarie. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very uh, good morning. Uh, let me begin by thanking uh, Sheng and Diri and Tunku uh, for uh, having me as one of the mentors. Uh, for me, uh, it's truly a privilege uh, to be here. Uh, now, obviously, uh, we all come from diverse backgrounds, and for me uh, personally, uh, I'm the typical kampung boy uh, who was um, given the opportunity uh, to change uh, our life. So, to be taken out of poverty uh, by being given good education. And obviously, as um, we progress, um, we were given that uh, scholarship. Um, uh, to pursue uh, our dream of becoming uh, a chartered accountant. Uh, a lot of people ask me, why accountancy? <laughs> <laughs> That's because when I was uh, young, I was told that accountants make a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> coming from a poor family, so we wanted more money. So it was actually the, the, the career that I pursued. Uh, plus, I was good in maths. Um, so, uh, and as an accountant, I just wanted to be a CFO, uh, but uh, given a lot more than that. So uh, I think um, having gone through um, some... Uh, very challenging circumstances in, in the past, uh, given the shot, uh, being able to uh, excel at it, 
uh, and alhamdulillah, I thought um, it'd be a great opportunity to actually share uh, with everyone. Mm. But uh, I must say, if I can, um, uh, all those success that uh, one would achieve um, would not be achieved without struggles. Yes. And I think that the need to persevere is actually very important. And I was truly inspired by Dr. David Nichols' uh, story, uh, coming from behind and uh, to be there. And uh, I think um, becoming a champion mm. uh, is uh, a major feat, but sustaining that uh, um, at the top, uh, that's even more challenging. And that's yes. something which I've learned um, along mm. the years as well. Mm. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and Dr. Shah. <coughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thanks to Diri for having me this uh, morning. Uh, it's truly inspiration for me. I mean, uh, some of those people I see here today, all those people who inspired me to be where I'm here today. Some of them, I've seen them very far. Some of them inspire them from closely. I see Naim Tansri is one of my inspiration. I mean, uh, the Tansri Nazir is one of my inspiration, but I get to see him closer, but I don't get to see Tansri <laughs> Nazir closely. But those are the people who inspired me to be where I am today. I'm sure this is a very important platform. I come from uh, Human Resource Development Corporation, yes. and I know how important is this kind of platform. Mm. And uh, today is all about self-directed learning. You know, oh, gone are those days. People, you put you in a classroom and they teach you 50 people, 100 people. But today the learning pattern has changed. Uh, the new norm of learning is all about similar to what Deary is doing. Mm. And yes. I'm congratulations to all those people who are behind this. And I think um, uh, starting is always difficult, but I think you, you don't give up. You just try to push it up, and you'll get to see where this will take you. And we have a lot of numbers, data, statistics that will share with you why this can be one of the good models yeah. of learning in the country. Mm. Uh, secondly, mm, inspiration is very important. Um, success gives you happiness. Failure gives you a lot of inspiration. <laughs> I think, uh, like what uh, Tansri Nazi said, uh, there are many times you have failed, but there are times you are successful. You are, uh, you know, that success are very large, so it has taken over the failures. Yes. But most of them, they does not know they are very close to success, but they give up. That's where the failure happens. Mm, so mm. I think uh, this kind of platform is very important, and I'm sure this will inspire more people to come and do better. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And then just just to add on to your saying, I have my own personal saying where you know life life is nothing like school. In school, you uh, learn your lesson and then you're tested. Whereas in life, you're tested and then you learn your lesson. Uh, so coming from that, thank you very much, Ashraful. So firstly, you know we have a lot of audience members here who are. Uh, practitioners themselves, um, HRs of respective organizations, talent management. Um, and so, you know, a lot of things that we're going to be discussing later today is, is very relevant to them. Things that, you know, we all know, right? So starting off with, firstly, we know the world is changing. Uh, we know the, the requirements for reskilling is, is tripled, quadrupled over the past few years. The, the, the lifespan of a technical skill now used to be 13 years. Now you're looking at four or five years at best before that skill is now outdated and you have to learn a new skill. So, so if I can start with yourself, uh, Tansri, with, with the challenges of a constant work, a workforce that needs to constantly learn, uh, constantly uh, adapt to unpredictable markets, um, uh, the, the, the technology trends and, and advancements, uh, what are your thoughts in terms of how can we can prepare the workforce for something like this? Well, thank you for that question. So um, yesterday, uh, upon arrival from the UK, I, I atten attended this uh, PMB Knowledge Forum. And uh, I was inspired by uh, some of the comments being made there. Was, um, instead of focusing on the, the changes, you must start with making sure that the, you build um, resilience in mm. the time that you have. Mm. And, and this is more about uh, making sure that every single person will have um, the soft skills uh, required. Mm. And with those soft skills, yeah, then you'll be able to adapt uh, to mm. all the changing landscape. So uh, within that context, um, you know, soft skills versus uh, technical skills. Uh, now, if I may, uh, Demiri, uh, one of my approaches in joining a new organization is that I would always go in alone and would always like to assess the talent that we have within that organization. Mm. Um, and once you've done your assessment and match it against your aspiration, uh, then you may find some gaps and you will bring those reinforcements uh, from outside. But in the main, uh, you'll be utilizing the talent that you have internally 
and how you will then be able to harness it. Um, now, after the context say, of um, Maybank, so I mean, Tan Sri Nazi, um, you know, spoke about the CMB, uh, if I may. Um, so CMB was very strong in investment banking, um, not so uh, in commercial and yeah. retail banking. Mm. Maybank was solid when it comes to retail banking, uh, SME banking, and corporate banking, uh, but less so in investment banking. So acknowledging uh, that um, gap that we have, we then brought in talents uh, in the form of um, you know, Tashri Farid, and we brought in uh, Teku Zafro. And with the two uh, gentlemen supported by the rest, that gave us the courage to acquire a new platform, Kim Eng, to build our investment banking capabilities, not just in Malaysia, but uh, across the region. Um, so that's actually how you supplement uh, your existing talent base with acquisition. But beyond that, you need to actually build that uh, further from there. Mm. And, and I think this is where, uh, when it comes to uh, investing uh, in talent, um, you do need to put in place a very good uh, talent development and succession uh, planning program yeah. internally. A and it's very, lab very laborious. Mm. Um, and uh, in the organization that I work with, uh, we would spend uh, twice a year where the CEO and the uh, executive committee members would go through um, all the key critical positions and for each position would identify um, who are the potential successors uh, and what would be the, the, the state of readiness and what would be the interventions required to prepare uh, those uh, potential successors to succeed the incumbent. And uh, we would do this uh, laboriously uh, mm. twice a year. Mm. Um, and uh, from there, we, we make the necessary investments, uh, whether it's actually in the soft skills mm. or technical skills, uh, mm. to your point, uh, plus also experience. So for example, there are some who uh, may have needed exposure to run a business. Mm. So we then say, okay, uh, let's put this um, CFO uh, to run um, a certain unit uh, and so yeah. on. So um, those are the investments that we put in uh, beyond the typical technical courses that's, uh, that's available. Okay, yeah, okay brilliant, brilliant. So I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic to hear. You're taking a more personable approach, uh, seeing individuals, what do they need and does it contribute to the organization? Um, and you know, I, we hear we hear that these things do happen amongst amongst other companies, other organisations. Uh, but that's what, Shahul, from you're essentially at that receiving end, uh, from coming from HRD Core. Um, do you see that coming from a lot of organisations? The trends of the kind of development requirements that organisations are asking, or is it more of a generic approach? You know, digitalization is happening, therefore we have to train on digitalization. Um, do you see the difference between the two and is there any trends that you can perhaps share with us? Um? Well, certainly. I, mean, I just want to go back to just now your question. You said there's a skills gaps are changing last year. It's about 10 years. Now it's three years. Yes. But honestly, it's not even three years. Every six months, <laughs> the skills are changing. If you can keep a skills for six months, uh. that is you're very good really. In six months' time, you must be ready to go to the next level of skills. Wow. If yeah. you don't move there, you're going to be left behind in the industry. Mm. So, but, but apart from... Not looking at the changes <laughs> in the skills. But also industry is changing. There's a lot of many factors. Today, human capital is very complex compared to 10 years or 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Especially post-COVID, it is much more complex. You know, um, five years, I mean, Tansri was there you know, heading many banks. Tansri would have mapped out human capital plan for the organization, five-year plan, three years plan. Mm. But today, you can't do that kind of planning for three years or five years. Mm. That is all very short term. Your loyalty is very short. Yes. Your planning have to be very short. Yes. So that's the challenge as human capital is going. The learning pattern is changing. Uh, the workforce pattern is changing. So if you want to keep up to the changes that is happening in the industry, ultimately the skills level and the skill set have to change. Um, of course, uh, digital uh, programs, digital upskilling dominates the whole industry. You go to any industry, um, no industry is without technology today. You know, recently I got the data. 25% uh, of the I mean, jobs is going to be replaced by artificial intelligence. Uh, this is what we see mm -hmm. and we hear from those people and we read it. And almost 45% of the jobs is going to be automated. Yeah. So that means you could see the fear among the people. Uh, what kind of fear people will have that, oh, I'm going to lose my job. Mm. But in reality, uh, these are theoretical. A lot of data comes in. 
But in, in reality, many times it doesn't happen that way. Yeah. We go back to history has a lot of data. History gives you a lot of good examples. Okay. When, um, when there was a transformation of locomotive, everybody said there's going to be loss of job. Mm. But it created so many jobs. Mm. When YTK was about to happen, people said computer is going to be gone. Yeah. People are going to lose jobs. It created a lot of jobs. The same thing will happen during artificial intelligence. You know, if AI can come in. AI cannot replace human. Yeah. As long as the technology is invented by a human, a technology can never replace a human. Mm. But the game is all about humanizing technology. Mm. If you want to be in the space, playing along with the technology, or, you know, or being ahead of technology, you must keep up to the technology pace. Yeah. Continue to upskill. Yeah. I can give you a good uh, case study, a classic please, example. Please Recently happened in, uh, in Bangalore, southern part of India. It was a, one of the largest uh, PR organization. Uh, you know, they used to do a lot of big jobs. And they found out recently with the chat GPT and AI, uh, they could replace some of the divisions in the organization. Mm. So they let go one of the organizations comprised of 25 people. Three months later on, they got to call back the whole division to come back to work. <laughs> and they realized that what human can do, the technology cannot do. So in a nutshell, that uh, there's a lot of fear in the industry. There's a lot of fear that has been created among the people mm. that mm. Uh, AI is going to take away the job, automation is going to take away the job. Mm. No, automation and AI will make your job very precise. You will get a lot of precision in the job, but it's not going to replace. Yeah. As long as you have the willingness to upskill and reskill, uh, learn and relearn, you will, will stay in the job. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and you're right. So, so and I, I like to, to, to bring out two points that both of you mentioned as well. Um, so, Tansu, you mentioned about you know, in actually having to invest uh, in people, um, having to take the you know, investment not only in money, but also in time. Uh, in, in making sure that you know, you're developing them correctly or correctly for the role that you're going to be in. Um, and to some extent, that counter, counter the aspect you mentioned about loyalty, right? We now know there's no such thing as, as company loyalty. Um, I don't think we find many people like Tansu Nazir who will stay in a company for 29, 30 years <laughs> nowadays. And we know that. Right? We're in, it's, it's, it's a fact that 50% that, you know, of millennials will say they'll leave within the next two years. 60 of Gen Zs will say they'll leave within one year. So how do you, how do you balance that then? Of, of, to your point of you know, development is a constant thing. Um, and therefore, technically what that means is my company needs to be constantly invested in my development. Yet, there is a fear that you know, I probably won't stay anyway. Um, so should they invest in me? So that's, it's, a, it's a rather uh, challenging thing with that one. So perhaps I can start with yourself, uh, Dr. Shahol, with your, with your point of view on that. I touch on loyalty, person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my father used to work for a company for 52 years. Wow. Yeah, 52 years. Yeah. He does not know what is the benefit of the company. He does not know what is the brand of the company. Either is it MNC, GLC, uh, he does not know anything. What he knows is that I got a salary yeah. that will help my family to move on. Mm. My kids are taking care. My family is taking care. Mm. I work for my first job. I worked for nine years at a Singaporean-based company. I want to f make sure that what my father did. I want to make sure my lifestyle is there. Mm. But next generation, my kids will work for three companies in a day. <laughs> That's the future of work. That's the future of work. Yeah. It's happening today. Yeah. So you can say what is loyalty when you look at my father for 52 years. Mm. You can say practically, okay, reasonably, okay, nine years I work for organization. There's a little bit of loyalty. But when my children are going to work for three companies in a day, how do you determine loyalty there? Mm. That's going to be a lot of complex. You've right. got, you got to look at the loyalty. You've got to look at the social security. You've got to look at the EPF. You've got to manage your you know, confidentiality. So the challenges for the future of human CHRO is going to be much more complex. I yeah. used to tell this in many talk shows when I went. If you think that uh, doctors and hospitals played an important role in coming out of COVID, equally the CHROs played a very important role mm. because nobody has any clue about COVID. Mm. But these are the people who sustain the business in spite of a lot of uncertainties. So I think the CHROs have to play a very dominant, important role if you want to make, I mean, take away with all these challenges. Yeah. And I certainly believe they got to be very real. Mm. When I say real means it is the responsibility of the CHRO to have the right candidate. Yes. You must have the empathy, you know, for people who work for you. And you must be authentic. You know, you can't have that kind of uh, drama. You know, mm. you want to tell the people, you want to do this, you want to do that, you're going to build a career for them, but at the end of the day, you don't really take care of them. 
the last but not least, you must show them what leadership is all about. That's where the CHRO played an important role. You know, human capital, you know, it is an intangible asset. It is not like a plucking out a balance sheet, you can say what is the value of the company. Yeah. This asset doesn't have the value. Mm. But these are the important assets that the company need to have. Either it's a success or failure, these are the people going to make things happen for you. And if today's moving future corporate in the modern world, if you don't take care of the people, the people is not going to take care of your business. Correct. This is very important. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, you know that I'm an accountant, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> therefore accountants are typically regarded as being stingy. Uh, so uh, in my past life as a CEO, uh, I don't normally pay top dollar uh, for talent. Uh, but um, we do pay competitively, but we'll never be able to uh, outmatch uh, other companies in terms of remuneration because if you um, attract talent based on how much um, you can pay them, mm. uh, there will always be someone who's prepared to uh, pay higher and they will leave. So I think it's important for you to bring the talent who believe in purpose, uh, who believe in the cause, uh, and who wants to, uh, people who want to be part of a winning team. So yes, uh, basically at the day, people want competitive remuneration, uh, they want conducive working environment, and they want good career progression. Uh, but if you can also convince them that they'll be part of the winning team, that would be a great yeah. value proposition. And of course, uh, you also invest in them, um, into uh, my earlier point about uh, giving, giving them that exposure, uh, not just uh, the, the, the technical skills training, but I think more importantly also, uh, the, the working uh, life experience exposure in various aspects uh, of the business. Um, so I think uh, my view is actually if you are able to deal with that, then you'll be able to attract and retain talent. Having said that, we must also re recognize the fact that at the end of the day, it's all about supply and demand. Yes. Um, so in today's environment, for example, uh, at Bruce Malaysia, uh, we've been developing talent uh, in the areas of sustainability. Mm. But because the demand is so great, so there's always out there people who would poach our people. Okay. Uh, so uh, as much as we want to retain them for at least five years, yes. uh, unfortunately, so many of them, uh, after three years, they get poached. Yes. Uh, but I think that's okay in the sense that um, you're not losing uh, the talent uh, outside of Malaysia. Mm. Uh, they are within corporate Malaysia mm. um, and therefore contributing. So what we need to do more, therefore, would be to invest and mm. new talent coming into this space. So produce a lot more people specializing specializing in uh, sustainability. And I think this is where uh, HR, you know, uh, the corporation uh, would play uh, a major role, uh, mm. supporting corporates in providing the necessary skills um, to uh, uh, corporate uh, to, to talents in the respective fields. Uh, so whether it's actually in sustainability or digital technology, AI, and so on. Um, so there'll be a lot more of these uh, small uh, micro uh, courses, um, I would say, um, that would then be able to be added up mm. uh, to become something more substantive, mm. uh, equivalent to a master's degree and so on. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I, th I think what would help, I mean, we ha as I mentioned, I have fellow uh, uh, talent management practitioners here, HR practitioners here. One of the challenges that... that HR, if we talk about HR directly, uh, faces is is getting that buy-in from the top management. Um, so, you know, Tansri Wahid, you may be exceptional to this, but there are CFOs, there are CEOs out there who do look at numbers and will prioritize numbers, finances over developmental needs. And that's one of the struggles that many HR personnel will face is trying to convince that, you know, we need to invest in people. Uh, but however, if we don't get that buy-in from the top management, we have to just do second best, third best, or even start you know, developing in-house and creating our own programs. Um, so if you can perhaps, you know, if you were to counter something like this, uh, you know, somebody wants to ask you that kind of question, uh, what advice would you give in trying to ensure that, you know, or perhaps you can share a success story even as to why doing something like this, why investing in development is critical? Uh, if you can share with yourself first, and then for for Dr. Shaholm after that, perhaps then as to you know being that receiving end, you would you see the kind of things that people are asking to be developed on, and I'm sure you see trends already, right? I know from from my own piece of work, from my own work, 
you know, towards the end of the year, people just immediately just buy a lot of development programs because they want to finish the budget. So you know that the, to your point, the, the authenticity is not necessarily there. Um, so perhaps we can start with, with yourself first and then uh, Dr. Shahul. Well, thank you, Damri. Um, accountants, uh, fund managers uh, and others, they don't look at costs as uh, simply costs. Uh, they uh, would compare that uh, with the return. So mm. typically we look at the return on investment. And return on investment, not just in monetary terms, but also I I in others, in terms of um, your brand building, uh, longevity, and so on. So in the context of uh, corporate Malaysia, so typically uh, all companies are you know, told to watch out your cost-to-income ratio. Uh, and then within your cost-to-income ratio, uh, whether it's actually 45% for banks, um, or 50% uh, for some others, uh, then you look at the, the uh, human capital cost um, you know, ratio uh, as well. So uh, I think um, uh, my view is that the, um, uh, it's fine Do you look at that, you benchmark against your other competitors uh, in various uh, markets that uh, you operate in, but at the end of the day, you must also ask yourself, uh, are you doing it sustainably? Mm. Uh, so for example, um, you can, uh, you know, contain cost, uh, but are you preparing that organization for the future? Mm. I'll give you one example. Um, at Telcom Malaysia, um, uh, when uh, mobile communications were coming in and we were moving away from analog to digital, uh, we did our productivity analysis and we determined that Telcom Malaysia was overstaffed by 3,000 people. Wow. Right? Um, so... Uh, naturally, the recommendation was to embark on a voluntary submission scheme. So, voluntary, not mandatory. Mm. Uh, but even then, it was actually painful. Uh, we embarked on that um, you know, uh, initiative. Um, in the end, uh, we were able to uh, separate uh, 2,000 staff instead of 3,000. Okay. Now, we saved 150 million ringgit a year. So, that's a huge wow. tick yeah. uh, in my KPIs. It was a huge <laughs> tick. But that was achieved as at a at another cost, mm. uh, in the sense that for a period of six months, Telcom Malaysia was distracted. Uh, before we implemented the uh, VSS, uh, there were speculations, will there be or will there not be? Mm. Uh, so people's minds were centered around that. The moment we announced that we were going to have that and we uh, offered uh, a period of three weeks for people to uh, consider whether they want to offer, for, offer themselves to be separated, um, so we have three weeks of, again, uh, uncertainty uh, meetings with all this yeah. centered around, uh, are you going to you know, offer or not offer? Yes. And then uh, at the end of the close, closing period, there will be that the anxiety uh, for those who had um, offered themselves to be separated, yeah. whether that would be accepted or not. And then once decision has been made, naturally, you have many good people who offered themselves to be separated, but of course, the company can't accept that. Mm, uh, mm. And they'll be disappointed because uh, they are being deprived of this uh, three four hundred thousand ringgit of compensation uh, to pursue another career and so on. So uh, I would say that there was a period of six months um, uh, that um, that organisation was uh, distracted and that uh, impacted the revenue growth and so on. Now learning from that uh, into Maybank, uh, when I joined Maybank, we did a similar productivity uh, study. And we determined that Maybank was overstaffed by 1,000 uh, okay, people. Okay. Um, so uh, part of that was contributed by uh, the advent of technology as well, uh, digitalization and so on. Um, then the recommendation typically from the consultants would be, look, okay, therefore, undertake a VSS. But learning from the difficult experience that I had, mm. then I said, look, you know, that's assuming that we will not grow. But if we can strategize that we will utilize these 1,000 surplus resources that we have to grow the business, to improve our customer service, then um, within 18 months, those numbers would have been justified. Meaning that when it comes to productivity ratio, when you grow by 20% per annum, mm. after 18 months, those 1,000 people, mm. uh, surplus were not there anymore. Not In there. fact, okay. you were able to utilize them to grow your business. And that was exactly what we did. Uh, and that enabled um, the company to actually grow. So again, so my request would be not to look at the people as cost, yes. but look at them as truly talent and resources uh, that you need to build up your business. Of course, uh, there'll be some retraining required, uh, which is yeah. actually small 
uh, cost uh, compared to uh, a small investment rather uh, compared to the the benefit that you, mm. you get. Mm. So again, uh, don't look, look at people just numbers. Mm. Uh, look at them as real people. Mm. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you for sharing. And and that's what I hope. Uh, adding on to my previous question as well. Um, I think one of the things that allow that needs convincing as well is the effectiveness of the development. Um, I'm sure many of us in our own careers, you know, we go for a development program, uh, sent away for two weeks, we come back, and you know, are we actually allowed to practice what we learned? Are we enabled to practice what we learned? Uh, so just adding on to the question I asked previously as well as to how do you then, you know, also convince that development is effective and it is needed? Well, I mean. Today, the training program happens uh, different organizations have different kind of programs. A different industry has different kind of programs. For instance, if you take up a digital marketing program, mm. digital marketing program for a pharmacy-based company or automotive company is too different. Uh, you can't fit one shirt for everybody. Number one. Number two, before you do any kind of training, it is very important that you need to do a TNA, training need analysis. Okay. You, know, okay. you need to know whether, you know, you can't just get in the training provider or content and you just... Uh, put 20 people in a classroom and just get them to do it. And it's a different kind of people have a different way of uh, learning pattern. Yeah. You must understand what kind of content, how is going to be delivered, what kind of assessment, how we are going to making sure that transfer of knowledge, transfer of technology happens. Mm. The training needs analysis is very important. Mm. For instance, for HRD Corp, we have this TEE, Training uh, Evaluation Effectiveness. Okay. Once every training is done, we are making sure that all the training companies, our employers, go through the training uh, TEE, so we are able to gauge the results, how effectively. That's mm. not the perfect solution. Yes. That's yes. better than not having anything. Correct. Uh, yeah. so, but we are trying to improve every time. There's a lot of new technologies, new applications that are coming in, which is nailing down precisely how is the transfer of, transfer of knowledge. Whether the training provider or trainer able to give the right content, that is determined by the employers. Mm. So these are some of the programs that we have put in place. But once again, um, the effectiveness of learning depends on the individual. Okay. I mean, I always tell this. Okay, good. You might have the best technology, you might have the best trainer, best content, but if you don't have the right attitude of learning, uh, nothing will uh, get you best there. Mm. I know the, we know what, what Tansi was telling, you know, um, you know, the, um, you know, salaries are expensive and all these things, you know, and, and when we employ people. Today, that pattern also has been changing. I always tell, you know, when, when, whenever my, I meet up with my HR, uh, I tell them, you know, uh, those candidates who are coming to us today, it's not we are interviewing them. Mm -hmm. They are interviewing us. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is the truth. Correct. Yeah. They come to us, they ask us what kind of salary <coughs> you give, what kind of benefits you give, what kind of what I can finish, what kind of, you know, um, work-life balance. I tell them, I don't know what is work-life balance before. Yeah, yeah. And now everybody, they come in, they come out of the university, they're asking what kind of work-life balance I have. Yeah. And um, after everything, they won't decide whether they will join with you. Yeah. And I always have this puzzle. Where in Malaysia we have unemployment? Yeah. I got 100 over jobs available. You know, I can't be, I'm not able to fill up for the last uh, one month. Yeah. yeah. You know, people send in 20 resumes for one position, five people at an interview, hardly one people take up the, one person even take up the job. Yeah. Even the one take up, um, next week they are no more in the same job. <laughs> so, this, this um, of course, the, the CHROs will know the, this is the reality. So, it when is. people tell me there's unemployment in Malaysia, I don't know where, where is it coming from. <laughs> Secondly, they come into the job, they just want to know what kind of salary, uh, work-life balance, uh, what the fringe benefits. These are the people, these are the factors that determine today's workforce. Right. Yep. And it's not like, you know, I give them 10,000, uh, you're able to work with me for long term. No. <laughs> mm. There are people who come to us just purely for, you know, not everybody come with a kind of, uh, you know, a desire that I want to make me money. Some of them just take job as a hobby, mm. passion. Mm. They just come in, you know, for their full-time job is different. This mm. is a hobby. Yeah. This is a passion. They come for seven hours, eight hours, and after <laughs> that, they go back. <laughs> this is how the workforce is moving yeah. towards, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Tell me from me. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, so, so perhaps another dimension in the sense that um, <laughs> I think one area where we could do better would be in terms of uh, matching the mm. supply of talent mm. with the demand. So I in some segments of society, uh, yes, they get to choose. But there are many others out there who are not being given the opportunity somehow. Mm. Uh, so for example, if you look at the, the graduate employability, uh, for Malaysian universities, um, I, I don't have the 2022 figures, but uh, based on the detailed numbers that I saw for 2021, uh, we had a graduate employability of 84, 85 uh, percent, and meaning that 
84 to 85 percent of the graduates uh, in 2021 were able to get um, a job within six months um, of their uh, graduation. Now, uh, the balance um, were not able to get anything. But out of that 85, and that would include people who were pursuing further education, 40% uh, were earning 2,000 ringgit and below. And 18% of them, of them were earning 1,500 ringgit and below. Oh, okay. So I, I think this level of um, underemployment, uh, meaning that people are actually uh, performing tasks below their academic qualification, uh, is actually serious. And, and I think uh, to me, it is actually, we're not doing great service <coughs> when we bring in young people mm. into universities and train them for three or four years. And at the end of it, 40% of them were getting 2,000 again and below. So uh, I think clearly that's that mismatch uh, between supply and demand. On demand side, uh, we also have um, the SM, the, the E and E uh, manufacturers yes. in Penang, for example, crying for 5,000 talent. Uh, so they, they're short of uh, staff, staff and they couldn't get it. So I think this where uh, having that proper matching of supply and demand, making sure that the graduates are trained uh, yeah. with the necessary skills so that they are employable. Um, I think that's actually very, very important. So uh, again, as much as we have a situation whereby uh, it's an employee's market, mm. we still mm. have a um, situation whereby many of the graduates are grossly underemployed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for sharing. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, it's tough. It's not easy uh, for sure. Um, I mean, I have my own younger sister who's applying for jobs in London and she struggled for the longest time until I asked her, how many roles did you apply outside zone two? <laughs> she goes, none. So it's very, they're very concentrated on this. So we do have a number of questions from, from the, um, the audience here. I'll try as best as I can to get through. Uh, but I think there's a really good question here, which, which we haven't quite touched upon so much yet. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, developing, growing, wanting to change... Um, at the end of the day, is to improve ourselves, but ultimately improve the organization, ultimately improving our, our competitiveness, and especially our competitiveness with regards to our neighbors, Singapore, Thailand, um, and on a more global scale. So there's a question coming here from one of the audience saying, for, for both of you, um, in your view, what is the one thing we need to change significantly in the current talent landscape to compete more effectively on the global scale? Uh, if I can start with yourself, Dato. <laughs> If you have the talent, focus on retaining the talent. Okay. If you don't have the talent, get the talent. But don't go for the best talent. There's no best talent in the country. The best is always produced by the corporations. Mm. First of all, you must give opportunity for people to come in. You know, everybody, when, when I talk to the people, a lot of the employers, they want the best talent industry. Uh, if, if people want the best talent, I wouldn't be here. Maybe many of them wouldn't be here. We are never the best at the start. You know, because when you come out of the universities, you never know, graduated, we have zero experience, we have zero exposure. So I think companies should bring them. But the, there's also a um, you know, chicken and egg. Employees expecting too much from the graduates. Mm. Graduates never had that kind of exposure when they come out of the university. This also go back to our, go back to our you know, um, educational system, also on the, the way how the content is created. You go back to the many international countries, um, the um, internship plays a very important role for the graduates. Yeah. I know many countries, you go back, the university graduates get placed before even they come out of the university mm. through the internship. So if you, if you are keeping the internship on the second year, it is not going to help the students anyway. Mm. After mm. the internship period, they got to go back to the university. Correct. Once they go back to the university, they lose contact with all those corporates, they built it up. If you are going on an internship on the final year, where you can finish off your one or two first semester, second semester on the final year, the last two, three semesters, you can go on with the corporate. Then you will have the opportunity to continue your internship with the respective countries. Uh, a classic example, in uh, 10 years ago, we did a program with um, a few NGOs, uh, Pomodo Internship Program, PINTA. Mm. Uh? Mm. So we took 120 graduates nationwide, um, mid and good results graduates, 120 graduates, we placed them in almost 20 top GLCs and MNCs. 97% mm. of them managed to retain the job in the same company. So it's not that our, we, our graduates are not competent enough to face the corporate world. Okay. The most important thing is that they don't have that opportunity, or they don't have the confidence to go and meet the corporate. If corporates can come in to give them opportunities, because large corporates are very process-driven. 
Yes. You know, I mean, yes. I, I mean, let me share the example of HRD Corp. HRD Corp, we got 88,000 employees are registered with us. 91% mm. of the registered employees are SME based. Out of the 91% SME based, only 31% of them are doing learning and development for the staff. Wow. So if you go back to the large scale employers, yeah. I mean, my first, when I graduated, I got my first job with IBM. I mean, I, I'm a programmer, C, Oracle, and Unix programming. Mm. I got my first job with Oracle, I mean, uh, IBM, which is in Tamantun. Mm. So when I go and came, I told my uh, late father that I got a job in IBM. I'm very happy. He said, no, you go to IBM, you can't learn. Okay. IBM is a very process-oriented organization. Mm. You are a young graduate. You must go back to the organization who can spend time with you, who can allow you to learn multiple things. That's good. So yeah. I have to deny, I mean, I have to say, you know, uh, I mean, I was so gifted that I say no to the IBM. No, IBM <laughs> say no to me. When I got the IBM, I got this, I said, no, I can't take it up. Then I went and took up a <coughs> job with another mm. organization, mm. which gives me opportunity to do a lot of job rotation. In a span of uh, one year, I'm able to go into the marketing operations mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy the, uh, you know, as a young graduate. Then I come to, it took almost two years to know what is my best fit. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know, then, then I build it up myself on that way. So the corporations coming in, must spend time on the graduates. You know, a lot of them don't think that learning and development is important. You know, today, HRD Corp, we collect almost 2.4 billion mm, yes. levy every year. Uh, we collect 2.4 uh, billion from almost 88,000 employers, and we're dispersing 1.6 billion. In uh, this particular year, we trained 1.6 million people. If mm. you go back into the history of HRD Corp, last 30 years, we collected 14 billion levy. Wow. We dispersed 10 billion. Yeah. Almost 20 million people have trained through HRD Corp. So as a Brilliant. country, uh, we are blessed that we have the structured fr framework in terms of taking care of human capital development. Mm. But it is just not the responsibility of the country to do alone. It is yeah. the employers must also be responsible. Uh, I mean, I talk to many, you know, we do many engagement nationwide. A lot of them, there are times that we do not have money, people want to go for training. Yeah. Today, people, you know, uh, we have money, but the employers don't have time to spend training. Yeah. They have two classic uh, reasons. If I train my people, they might leave me. Yes especially on the SME space. Because SME, the loyalty of the employees are very short. Yes. Because they want to move jobs <coughs> with the better facilities, better benefits and everything. The, the SME bosses say, if I train my staff, they might leave. Mm. Or if I train my staff, they'll ask for a better salary. Mm. So I tell them, you don't do, do this too, they are still going to leave. Yeah. Am I right? Even you don't do this too, they're going to leave. So you have the fund, you have the levy, utilize the fund, train them. Because during COVID, there are times we had unemployed graduate, unemployed, unemployment problem. But today we are having unemployable problem. Mm. Because mm. during COVID, a lot of them lost job. They went on to a passive income. They mm. go on to income generation. I know many pilots, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, many bankers, many ho tourism, hospitality industry, senior people lost job and they went on to a passive income. But when the market is back, they are very complacent with the passive income. They don't want to go back to the active yes, income. Yes. So when you don't have the active income coming back and you don't have a good graduates are able to come out, the industry will have a lot of brain drain. Mm. I mean, when the brain drain cannot be addressed just by you know, giving them the benefits, there's a lot of other factors you've got to do. Macro and microeconomics comes into play. So I think today the industry employers and the employees have to believe that lifelong learning is a very important factor if you want to stay put in the, yeah. the job, you know. Yeah. Uh, skills gap, all these things is a never-ending story. It's yeah, a global yeah, issue. Yeah. You know, skills gap continue to happen when you fail to train yourself. Yeah. When you come out of the university six months later, if you don't upgrade yourself, there's a gap. Yeah. So you can't say that, you know, you can't blame the university. You mm. can't blame the teacher. You can't blame your parents. Mm. Your failure to upgrade yourself is your problem, mm. and that will cost you into skills gap. Mm. Continuous way of learning, lifelong learning, will address these problems. Mm. Then you will be always needed in the industry as a good talent. Good, good. Thank, thank you. you, thank you. And I think that touches upon what was said in the first fire chat just now about you know the self-driven, self-accountability, and and having to find that inspiration for yourself. So yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, Demri, on my part, perhaps uh, three areas. Uh, one is uh, the need to pay talent fairly. Uh, secondly, about <laughs> enhancing your employer employer value proposition, mm. and third is about truly embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, DI, if you like. I, I think the first one, um, it is said that the uh, median wage uh, in Malaysia for 2021 was only 2,250 ringgit, uh, meaning that half of our workers actually are paid below 2,250 ringgit. Today is probably about 2,005 
which is still very low. So I think uh, it is important for us to pay uh, our people fairly. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, EVP, uh, mm. in terms of making sure that uh, you provide them with uh, good career progression, condu conducive working environment, um, and the opportunity for them to, uh, to grow, the uh, upward mobility, uh, and again, anchoring back on the purpose of your organization. But, that th but the third one, you see, to me, um, very compelling. Uh, not just embracing diversity, equity, inclusion um, within your workforce. Uh, and uh, by diversity, I mean not just uh, gender, ethnic, uh, and age, uh, but also more importantly in terms of backgrounds. And this is where uh, in our selection process, uh, so the typical corporate organization would pick um, you know, first class honor, second class upper from the top universities. Yeah, yeah. And they go through the psychometric tests and so on. Uh, which in sometimes uh, appears more like an English test uh, <laughs> rather than anything else. So the outcome from that uh, would be typically the, the top uh, ones to get recruited would be uh, from your typical UK top universities uh, in certain dis disciplines and so on. Uh, and uh, invariably, most of them will come from privileged background, meaning that uh, from, uh, you know, uh, from from from. Clang Valley, uh, if I may. Mm, mm. Um, so we have seen these cases. So I think it's important for employers in their recruitment to look beyond that, uh, making sure that you have appropriate um, representation, uh, people from outside of Clang Valley, uh, in the states of um, you know, Kelantan, Terengganu, Pahang, uh, from um, Sabah, Sarawak, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, from different uh, universities as well, uh, local uh, as well as um, uh, foreign universities, uh, and making sure that uh, when you have these people coming from underprivileged background, typically they are hungry. So these are the people with very little safety net, uh, the ones that can just walk away uh, after two years saying, oh, sorry, I'm burnt out, I need sabbatical yeah. for one year, yeah. I need work-life balance. <laughs> uh, these are typically people from the privileged uh, Clang Valley people, but for those coming from underprivileged background, they're hungrier. The hunger. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and I think this is where when you provide these people with that opportunity to uh, succeed in their career, um, it, you know, it will be more sustainable and mm -hmm. the impact will be greater because uh, once they're successful, they intend to inspire mm -hmm. others in their community as well. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, I would like to encourage pick people more from the uh, underdeveloped states uh, mm -hmm. in Malaysia. Uh, from Sabah and also from Sarawak. Thank mm -hmm. you. And, 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 and that's a really good point. Uh, something which my own previous mentor also told me, that when you develop somebody, you're not developing them, you're developing the entire village uh, and impacting all of that. Um, so just, just one last question before we wrap up, and I, it's directed to you, Tansri Wahid, but I'll open up to, to both of you. It's a nice, nice little question. Um, so both of you, illustrious careers, uh, cutting across different industries, uh, different levels. How has your own journey in personal development uh, influence your approach to leading and developing others? If I can start with you, uh, Tansri. Uh, thank you. Well, um, I, I was given um, uh, the shot, so to speak, um, at education and uh, oh. at every uh, part of my career. A along the years, um, I had the privilege of learning from some great leaders. Uh, some of them may be you know, pri private in nature, uh, but uh, they've all uh, contributed uh, towards my uh, growing up in my career. Um, so uh, one of my bosses at Bumpetramachim um, Bankers, for example, uh, I still remember uh, my first credit uh, memorandum uh, to him uh, when he got back to me, had more red ink uh, <laughs> uh, corrections uh, than the, the black ones that uh, I typed. Uh, so the point is that he took the trouble, time and trouble to actually uh, guide me, coach me, okay. uh, and correct my mistakes and so on. A and that's something which I would like to actually give mm. to others as well. Mm. So meaning that dedicate a bit more time, uh, be a bit more patient to expose your subordinates uh, to the exposure that you had, uh, pointing them to uh, some of the mistakes uh, that they've made and continue to inspire them. Inspire them. So I think um, making yourself accessible okay. uh, to yeah. others is something which I uh, hold on to. Thank you for sharing. Okay. And... and I thought if you could finish. Myself, when uh, I started my career working for people, I worked for two important organizations. One is a Singaporean-based company, one is a Hong Kong-based company. Um, you know, the second one was I was almost a, 
partner to it, and we want to go for listing in Hong Kong. During the SARS, we couldn't do it. Then once I finished my that career, I started to become an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur for almost uh, um, 15 years. Uh, I understand the challenges of entrepreneur, how difficult to be an entrepreneur, to be a successful entrepreneur is much more difficult. Then when I have passed that, uh, when I was during that phase, you know, um, COVID, uh, I was asked to come in on national service, uh, take care of HRD Corp. So I've seen the difference of uh, work uh, challenges, expectation in the three different areas. But all three has been a great journey. There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of um, ups and downs. But overall, um, you just pick up the best. You know, you know there's always negative. There's always uh, flaws. But you always look into the positivity of everything. Yeah. And we pick up those uh, mm. uh, things, you know. I mean, everywhere there's a lot of critics, there's a lot of happenings, but public opinion is always fickle. You know? <laughs> it, it doesn't pay, the opinion doesn't pay the bills, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, what we need to do, we must be do it very honestly, uh, diligently. Yeah. And that's why I, I realize, you know, that there are five P's that is very important for a leader to uh, do it. But this changes over the period of time. If you ask me what is the 5P 10, 15 years ago, it's very different. Yes. But today is very different. You yeah. know? Um, you've got to have, have a right plan with the good people who have the passion to work for you, yeah. who can make profits, and there's at last the purpose. Okay. You know? But today, for me, purpose is more important than the rest of the Brilliant. other things. If you ask me if I, 20 years ago, I was more, and I want to make money, I want to do, today is about purpose. What is the purpose of uh, that we are here? What do we contribute back to the society yeah. that we have come across the way? So I think okay. there's a lot of different learning, but it's always interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, so thank, thank you, gentlemen, for, for your time. Uh, you know, my key takeaways from here, I believe, is you know, development is definitely challenging. Uh, development is definitely required. It's a necessity. But if you do it with empathy, if you're authentic about your approach, um, then you'll definitely succeed um, in what you're trying to achieve. So thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for the two gentlemen up here. So, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, there's lunch, I believe, one floor down. Uh, if your tummy is rumbling, please do. <laughs> please do eat. Uh, and again, thank you everybody so much for, for attending the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.